What is up? I am Miguel Antonio, and this is the Live and Create Podcast. It's where I interview artists and entrepreneurs about what it means to live a great life and create great things. And this is the pre-COVID edition. It's a series of interviews I did back in 2019, and even though a whole lot of life has happened in between, I still wanted to get these stories out to you because I think you're going to find great value in it. On this episode, we have Richard Cooper. Richard is the director of So Far Sounds Las Vegas, and he also owns multiple companies that help other artists build their brands. In this episode, we talk about his history of growing a multi-location bakery and all the lessons he learned from that and how he applies it to artistry. And he also probably says one of my favorite lines of the podcast so far, where he says, if you have a great product, you really don't have to sell it. You simply have to create opportunities for people to be able to taste it. We dive into a whole bunch of topics. It's a great conversation. Hope you guys enjoy. The Live and Create Podcast. And with probably the most important question, I think, out of all this stuff, when we dive into like the philosophical things, is if French toast and pancake had a fight, <laughs> who would win? Well, I, I, I know I looked at this question... And I'm still kind of wondering. I'd, I'd like to actually go ahead and just see the fight. Yeah. And then see where that lands. So you're willing, <laughs> you're willing to put like 50-50 and just see, see where I'd it like goes. I'd like to go up and see, and then maybe there'll be another fight. <laughs> you know, this is Vegas. We usually do, do a second round here, so I'm down to see they how it They can have a comeback, out. like if French Toast is down, that first yeah. one. Okay, I like that. A little yeah. Vegas Vegas has Vegas made me vibe. a betting man, and, and to, in a way to, to think about how things are going to play out, and if I don't know something, yeah, I don't know. You know, but there's always another chance to go to make a bet when you take That's a little chance to, to look back at it. You know, I dig and, it and see how it's going to play. Yeah. So you've been out here in Vegas now for six years. Yeah, about six and uh, so what are some other things besides becoming a betting man <laughs> and knowing that you want to see a fight a few times? What are some other things that you feel like you've learned just by being in the city or taken in by being in the city? You know, it's it's funny because I I don't really gamble at the tables and stuff. Uh. Uh-huh. I, I, but I, I see the parallels. I, I really do like the the whole gambling side of things because there's people that make a living gambling really? here. You know, there's people that are professional poker players that that would be they're, legit. They're, they're just legitimately playing the odds in a way that's going to be favorable to them. Yeah. Um, and when I started trading stocks, which was about probably four or five years ago, mm-hmm. the way that it was likened to me, the way that it was explained to me, was it's like you're betting on stocks. It can either go up or down. You can either That's win true. or you lose. But what you're trying to do is make it so that it is a, a winning thing in your favor. Right. You know? And with stocks, you actually have a, a, good, a good advantage that you can actually have over things on the tables. And the tables, you, the odds are against you. <laughs> things are already there, bad for you. Yeah, especially if you trade in a certain way. I know, like, I've been looking at the index funds and those kind of things mm-hmm. where it's like you're putting the odds more in your favor when you, can you look be. at investing. It's closer to being a 50-50 actual chance. Yeah. And the more information you give yourself, the better chances you give. Boom. And really understanding that from the, the gambler's perspective yeah. has changed the way I look at almost everything else in my life. That's you know, awesome. And I, I honestly, do, when I say I'm a betting man, it might not be a betting man like on the, the craps table. <laughs> but I, when I'm out and I'm looking at an artist that I'm working with, yeah. when I'm talking to somebody, when I, when I work on a piece of art that I'm doing, you know, I'm thinking to myself, what are the chances this is going to work out? That's cool, and though, it, to hear how it really does this idea of betting. You're betting on an artist, essentially. Mm-hmm. And so it sounds like you're trying to come more from the perspective of the stock investment. Uh, in a way. In that I regards. mean, it's... It's really, it's about risk and reward. Like, yeah. I try to go off and think about what's the risk for what I'm doing and what's the, the reward for what I'm doing. Right. Is it worth that risk, you know? And that changed a lot of stuff because what I see oftentimes, what I see artists doing and, and just people in general working-wise, is they're doing something where it's probably not going to work out in their right. favor. And then that, that's the worst thing I hear about from traders <laughs> is that they go off and they're holding on to something that they know is a loser. But they put so much in at this point, they got to hold they on. Can't, yeah, they can't I have a friend who does investments, <laughs> and he, he tells me, he's like, yeah, I have some other friends, the way that they choose to invest. He's like, I swear, every week I'm talking them off the ledge. They just want to jump <laughs> off the ledge. They're like, I lost so much money. He's like, I told you you shouldn't be investing that way. But they, they love whatever it is that's drawing them, if it's the, the high-risk piece of it, whatever it is. Yeah. But he's like, dude... You know, this, this isn't going to work out. It didn't work out last month. And... No, it doesn't. <laughs> so you do a lot of different businesses. seems like you've learned to bet on yourself. 
yeah. in a lot of ways. Is that something that's always been there for you or is that something fresh since you, um, I think you left, if I remember the story right, you left Georgia to come here mm -hmm. or LA to come here? Uh, Georgia to come Georgia. here. Georgia, eventually, you were in LA. LA to Georgia and then Georgia to, to Vegas. Vegas. So <laughs> take a long ride. So anyways, this idea of betting on yourself, like you're an artist, entrepreneur, um, did you learn that here? Or is that something that's been ingrained in you? Uh, honestly, it's been something that's been ingrained in me. It's just that I, I see it more clearly now. Yeah. It's something that I didn't articulate very well. It's like when, when you decide who you want to work with, right? Mm -hmm. Generally, you, you think about, well, I'm going to work with myself. Yeah. That's a self-investment, you know? And now it's, it's not so much that I want to invest just on myself. It's that I know I have to diversify my portfolio. Yeah. I have to go off and invest in other people. And when I invest in just in myself, I end up kind of limiting my, my possibilities. So it's become about more I'm out trying to find other people to invest in. That's pretty cool. And I mean, that's what I do for a living is I look for opportunities or try to create opportunities. Not for, for me. You know, for other It's people. for other people. That is, that is my, that's, that's how I make things work. Yeah. You know, I'm like, hey, you know, this could work out really well for you. This, this is a, and then I, I want them to have good results. Absolutely. You know, whereas, you know, like, you, uh, what was the name of that movie where the, um, oh, goodness, where the guy's the stock trader and he's, he's like selling the, the, the shorts on it. Oh, yeah. Um, I, with Lita, I, we I were believe. talking about that. On the phone, um, <laughs> I cannot think of the name with Brad Pitt in it. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, yeah. Oh, it anyway. Pitt's in? yeah, anyway. But the, yeah. the, the, the movie goes off and talks about this guy who's trying to get people to invest in stuff that's terrible, right? You know, and with the, the chance of making the commission off it. To me, that doesn't work out well. Yeah. I want to make, I want to to be good so that people have repeat business. See, and that's know? the it's like short term versus long term. I constantly think through that: is this a short term decision or a long term decision? And yeah, like cheating people out in the beginning, you're doing all right for a second. Could be, yeah. But you, know, you gotta move. You gotta like move to new city every single time. You might last a good six months, and you gotta yeah. keep moving on. So and I learned that from the bakery that I was working at. Yeah. that I ended up running later, later was on. Was that in, in Georgia? Life. That was in Georgia. Okay, I actually, when I was about uh, about fourteen, fifteen, uh, about fourteen, um, I was ready to drop out of school. This was in ninth grade or so, or mm -hmm. excuse me, like in the middle of tenth grade, and I was like. I'm not getting what I like out of school. School doesn't like me. And I was, <laughs> I was doing very well in my classes, like all my little gifted honors classes. Right. And I was Your AP and this and all that. Yeah. But I wasn't what they wanted me to be doing. Or they, I wasn't doing what they wanted me to be doing. In what which way? Which was like, they wanted me to go off and just play sports. They wanted me to, to you know, just keep my head down on stuff. And yeah. I was doing, I was wilding out outside of school. I was taking <laughs> care of my school stuff. But I, it's but weird But you were trying to, be, to enjoy life. Yeah, it's well, weird to be like the, the person who is like the bad guy or the bad kid or whatever who's uh -huh. doing all kinds of crazy stuff outside of school. And but at then school you got getting, locked down. Yeah, but then school, I come yeah. and get awards. And it doesn't look good <laughs> to, to the school administration. We're giving them an award, but damn, I saw them yeah. last Friday. What? You know, I was winning like talent contests and stuff. I was wow. really popular. I, I, was, I was having a good time. Yeah. Um, but I was also running businesses outside of, of school and stuff. And when I started to work at my bakery... Mm. Um, that took on a whole nother thing. I was like, you know what? I'm I'm doing well at my bakery. You know, I, I could do this. Yeah. Instead Why, of instead of thinking what your studies. Yeah. Instead of trying to take care of the stuff of the school, because I was, I was at the point where the schools were not teaching me fast enough. Yeah. And they were not catering to what I wanted to learn. This is uh, this is me coming from a a really nice school in L. A. Which was a, it wasn't really a private school, but it was like a honors magnet school, and you had to like get on a high achievers. Thing to get or, in there. Yeah, it's a weird way to get, get, to get into it. Yeah, um, to being like kind of in a backwoods, like countryish school in the <laughs> middle of this is like rural Georgia where I'd moved out to. Gotcha. And like they just they were not they were not ready for me. <laughs> like and, what do we do with this? Yeah, I don't know. That was a I don't whole know how that was a whole issue. This. And I didn't know what to do with them either. Right. You know? So I met a lot of people, and I'm, I appreciate having met those, you know, met different people and playing, going four wheeling, and you know, just like doing the whole all the rural thing, things. You know? Cow tipping? Did yeah, you do some? Cow I tipping? didn't get to do any cow oh, tipping. Okay. But I, I have friends literally who were like inviting me to do this kind of stuff. <laughs> I got so. asked so many times. I grew up in a small town in Kansas, and I got asked a lot, but I never ventured out. I remember going into a pasture one time with a group of friends. It's like midnight, but we couldn't really. I don't think. I think it was like an idea everyone had, but then we got there, we're like, what the hell do we do now? We're here. We, we literally tip the cow. So we yeah. never figured it out and just moved on from that. But that's cool, man. So you dove into a bakery, and it sounds like you're like 15 yeah, at this bakery, point. 
And I, but I learned that we like we never did advertising there. Mm. I looked into advertising it when I was later in the year, so that was probably when I was somewhere around 24, 25, something like that. Um, after I'd been running the company for a while. Yeah. Um, because I started there as a dishwasher. Nice. So from like Working going from way. dishwasher to the point where we were ready, we went ahead and fired the, the other people. It was a small business at the time. This is like coming out of uh, working in somebody's house. We had just opened up into a uh, into a warehouse. That's like cool though. Commercial space. Great experience, especially at it that age, great. to see something grow like that. And I had the, the mentors that became like my step parents in a way. Like they, it was two guys, and they were partners, and they were working hard to mm. to make their dream happen. And they needed someone to help make their dream happen. Yeah. And working in a small business environment where everybody counts, and there's not just like we'll call if you call out, there's somebody else to come in. <laughs> right. Like everybody's it's like, there. what do you mean you're not coming in because this messes this messes exactly. up everything, bro? Yeah, exactly. And that, but that put a lot of pressure on me. But at the same yeah. time, it was an opportunity. And I, I, I'd, I'd been working in you know business for the longest time. I'd worked as an actor since I was seven, and yeah, I'd been working pretty consistently. And when I got into the bakery, it was just a fantastic opportunity to be at the start of something that ended up making millions of dollars. It was, That's it was a very very good bakery. It's, it's hands down like the best bakery in the southeast. And just I have to make sure it. I get the name and uh, when yeah, I'm Alpine in Georgia. Bakery. I, Alpine, Alpine Bakery, Alpine bakery mm-hmm. in middle of nowhere, Georgia. Is that no, what? Now, now it's a, now, <laughs> now it's spread out. I think they're okay. um, all together probably about uh, eight or nine states throughout the southeast. Really? Um, and, and I'm headed that way um, early 2020, so I'll have to. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely have to check it out. Uh, they bakery. have a few open uh, spots that are the retails, and then they sell to a lot of different. Um, like diners, and yeah. small restaurant chains, and stuff like that. Well, that's a huge opportunity, especially as a young person being in there, 14, 15, seeing this thing grow from a basement to, like you said, now they're franchising yeah. it. You have these oh, we mentors. Try, we tried to franchise. That's actually right. why I left, because they weren't going to go off and grow as fast as I, I wanted them ah, to. Ah, so you want to see some other opportunities. I wanted to see it to, to, to take it on. I was like, we should straight out franchise this. Yeah. You know, this is great. We have a great product. We have great headquarters. We, we sell already to a bunch of different states. You're Let's like, take come it to on, another guys. level. You know, and like I think that what I was talking about for the the reason why I was saying that I learned so much from that is because I learned how important repeat business was. Mm-hmm. Because without any advertising, it was all word of mouth. Yeah. But when one cake goes to one party, and twenty people eat it, and it's a good product, I learned what a good product like a good legit. product sells itself. Once yeah. you get it into somebody's hands, mm-hmm. it's you're not trying to sell it. You're just trying to get the opportunity to have somebody taste it. Yeah. And, well, you know, it's it a very important thing to learn how, what a good product is. <laughs> are those some things that, because you had said the, the two owners, they had mentored you. Are those some things that you feel like they instilled in you? It's, or is that something you I just kind of picked up? I observing? learned a lot. I mean, I learned so much. Like, now I cook and, and do stuff because we, we ended up opening to a restaurant, the pizzeria and stuff. I learned yeah. a lot about food and everything. Um, I should have texted you at like 8 a.m. and said, hey, man, could you bake something right? <laughs> for this interview? Now in my spare time, I make cakes when I have you know, a party to go to. Just for fun. You know? And you show up and they're like, geez, well, this like, is Are amazing. you like a chef or something? I'm like, I used to be. I retired. <laughs> you retired. <laughs> you know? I love it. I retired at 17 because it wasn't going right. where I wanted it to. So 27. 27 for that one. Oh, it was 27? Yeah, now I'm oh. 34. Oh, so you, okay, I had no idea you're 34. I wouldn't have guessed that at all. <laughs> it doesn't look like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so my picture of the timeline was a lot shorter. So you were with them from 14 all the way to 27? About 27, yeah. That's amazing, man. Yeah. So what were some other things that you felt like you learned from the mentorship and being around those owners? I feel like there's taxes. always taxes. I, I learned how to be conservative in my, in my financial. Mm-hmm. Um, it really, because when you have people to pay, mm-hmm. you know, when you have employees, and at that, when I left the bakery, I had over 200 employees. Wow. And that, that makes it, it gives you a very different perspective on how important that money is. Mm-hmm. Because there were times when, I, when we had first started the bakery, yeah. and there was, I mean, this is when it was so small. I'm talking when there was like maybe four employees. Right. You know, where I was like, oh yeah, I wash dishes, I deliver cakes, I, I clean, I, I do this. And you're taking care of the books. Yeah, and I got to start, I've got books to take care of. Yeah. But there were times when, when we started to hire on other people, and I'm like, I have to make sure they have their paycheck. Mm-hmm. I've seen pe- I've met other business owners. I do business consultation now, and mm-hmm. I, I've met other owners who will just like they have a personal bill or they have something they need to go buy, and they'll take money right out of the register. Yeah, and I'm like, you got to keep your books. Yeah, on point. How are you going to tell your employees you can't pay them, and yet you have a new iPhone? 
How? Yeah, and I've seen that before where people show up or they get the check and they go to cash it and what? it bounces as like what is a that? paycheck. That's nuts. That, man. You can't do that. Yeah, you can't keep, you can't <laughs> you keep can't good employees you know? doing that. I never did that with the bakery. Mm-hmm. There were times when it's like, okay, well, I'd like to have something, you know, something else mm-hmm. and I have this money, but I have to pay my employees. Right. You know? And it was tight like that. I mean, I, I, it, it went on to make very good money. Yeah. When we opened our first retail spot, within the first like two months, we had made a million dollars. But in the right. beginning of any entrepreneur this endeavor, was, we're counting pennies. Yeah. Man. Unless <laughs> unless you have a big investor, which means down the yeah, road you got to pay a lot of people back. But no, no, self invested yeah, from those guys. That's not real life, man. That's even this. As I start this solo career, you know, I'm sleeping on couches where. You know, touring with my band previously, we were getting used to, you know, hotels and doing all this kind of thing where it's like, nope, all right, we got some protein shakes and we're sleeping on couches. Let's, yeah. let's launch this thing, man. So I remember eating some, you know, making bread literally to eat. Yeah. At the bakery. You know? <laughs> um, You're like, I can do this at cost. This is legit. Yeah, it was pretty cool. It was cool to, to, to learn the food side of things because food is an important thing. Yeah. You know? It's kind of kind of it, important. Well, it's kinda pretty, pretty important vital part to people, of you know? Every day. And I... <laughs> I really do take that to, to heart now because there's so many of my friends who can't cook. Mm. Much less, I, I don't know any of my friends really that make bread. Right. But I wouldn't know where to start yeah, making you know? bread. I mean, I could probably get a box, yeah, follow yeah, the instructions, there. but it probably won't turn out that great, let yeah, alone like good, some kind know? of artisanal masterpiece that you guys are probably kicking out. Yeah, you know, but it, it does, it changes how I eat. Yeah. You know, and it changed how I thought about eating and stuff hmm. as well because I, I knew about the ingredients that were going into it. So it you just know? gave you more of appreciation of what you're actually going, the fuel you're putting into your body. Yeah, and I thought when I left the bakery, I was working, um, what was that, uh, 135, 136 hours a week. Wow. Um, we're talking about like 22-hour days. That's that real-life entrepreneurship right there. <laughs> yeah, this is, like I was sleeping in my office at times. Yeah. You know, when I, and when I, when I had left, I had, a car, I had someone drive my car. Uh-huh. I had three homes that I was maintaining. Nice. You know, it was, it, it changed you know, within, a, I'd say probably a decade and a half, it, it did change pretty dramatically. Yeah. But it was a lot of hard work, and I realized how much hard work it takes to, to do a business, yeah. to make a business happen, especially to the point where it's like 200 some you know, employees. It's that's a very, very big difference. That's a pretty big endeavor right you know? there. And, I mean, it's not, it's not thousands of, of people, but just having that appreciation of seeing how the financials when you, when, you, when you understand the financials yeah. and you understand the mathematics side of it, then it starts to dictate how a lot of the rest of the stuff has to work. It gave me a different appreciation for money. Mm-hmm. You know? And I, I didn't think... It, it's weird when I think of money originally because I was at one point like a very, very, very hardline liberal Democrat person. Yeah. I was all about the, the spending on it. And I thought that money just came from, from the government. You know? And I, I wanted the government to pay for things mm-hmm. constantly. And then as a business owner, paying taxes on stuff. <laughs> you right. were like, have you heard uh, Brackets by J. Cole? Oh, no. His, no. He talks about that, like, just his perspective great, now like as CLB. a hip-hop artist. And, I mean, it may, I mean, probably pays more in taxes than I made in the last 10 years, mm-hmm. you know, in one year kind of deal. Um, but it's an interesting song as he dives through, like, what does that mean? What does that mean for the community I came out of? And what does that mean for me now and how I live? It's, it's really cool. T- it's a cool tune. You have to check it out. No, it's, it's, it, to me, what I, what I learned out of it, though, is it wasn't that I changed my, my progressive views on how I wanted things to happen socially. Yeah. It's that I, I realized that everything that has to be done that has to be paid for isn't going to be paid for by the government. Yeah. It's going to be paid for by, by some business or it's going to be paid for by some people or whatever. Either and through taxes or through like donations and write-offs? Is mm-hmm. that what you oh, mean? I mean, or? however it's going to get paid for, but it's not the government really providing for it. And it gave me a, a disdain almost for the U.S. government. <laughs> you know, when I started to see how they would implement different laws that affected my employees. Yeah. Like when, when Obamacare came out mm-hmm. and it made it so that I had to... I had to fire a bunch of employees. Oh, man. Right, we're talking about like almost like 50 or 60 employees I had to, to, to fire. And, that, and everybody else, I had to, to cut hours and stuff and turn people into part-time employees. What was it that, that um, Because it was a mandate that, that was for, for health insurance that I had to cover of health insurance. how many insurance employees you could have at a certain level? Um, yeah, that well, it went down. It, it was one, so it's, The way that happened, I forget exactly the, the month right. thing, but it went like down in stretches. So you had like if you have 5,000 employees mm-hmm. or more. And then it went down to like if you have 500 employees 
you know, or, or a little bit less than that. Then it went down to if you had like less than 200 employees. Right. And so this is how much you're responsible for at each tier mm -hmm. kind of thing. Okay. And, and then it got to a point where I'm like, we just got to a point where we were able to get our self health insurance. Mm -hmm. We're still paying for it. I said, there's no way I can pay for the, the 200 employees right. health insurance on this. So I had to cut them. Yeah. And it made me have to make some decisions that I didn't want to go off and That's make, but that I had. Decisions. It's a, it's a decision when, when it becomes a, a when it's a very close to you company. Mm -hmm. You know, it's different if you go to work somewhere and you're like you're the manager at Chick Fil A or something like that, <laughs> and you, you hate your people around there, whatever. It doesn't really matter, right? You know, but you work for a big company that you don't ever really see the rest. But this of is kind of like a baby that this you is like a grew family. from. Yeah, these people I know. These people I go to their birthday parties and stuff. I was very involved with all these people. I right. knew these people quite in intimately. And I didn't hate them. It's, I just couldn't afford those things. Right. You know, and I saw how, how mandates made it so that it was more difficult for me to go off and provide for my employees what I wanted to provide for. Because mm -hmm. my partner had talked about how it, his, his uh, I think it was his grandpa's business or something, they had built out a kind of like a, uh, a medical clinic at the at their employment place. Right on. Yeah, there's you a know? company in Kansas City that they have like amazing medical clinic right in their company. That seems so much more beneficial. It right. seems like it Probably would be more Probably not feasible for every company. A no, bakery with not. a medical no, center, not. maybe not, but this yeah, one is an actual not. medical but, company. <laughs> but I see how it, with the way that technology has been has been moving along where right. it makes it actually be more possible where mm. we can do more for our employees. But the the, the bigger issue that was on that is that it would be more cost effective. Mm -hmm. That there's things that we could have done that would have been better for, for us thinking of it in a different way. Right. And that's all it was about. It was, because from a business perspective, from a songwriter's perspective, all these sort of things, it's not about necessarily, well, what can work. It's what can work best. Right. So whether I'm changing out a verse or I'm looking at how to, to attack a problem, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's a social problem or some issue like that, it gave me a different perspective on it because normally I'm the employee or most people are the employee yeah. and they now don't have you, to go off. Now drive. all the hard decisions are sitting right in your lap. Yeah, because as a business. people that you care about. Well, yeah, because as a business, I see where the money's coming in. Mm -hmm. I see how much money there is. So when they think to themselves, oh, well, you've got plenty of money to do certain things. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, you think I have plenty of money. To do but all that money is allocated somewhere. Yeah, it's like when I was talking about when I had the three homes that were there. It seems nice. But some of those homes I couldn't go see. Some of those homes were, well, all those homes were rented. Right. You know, th it's not something that I owned on these things. You weren't just like hanging out in one on one weekend. And, and I was working 22 hours a day. Yeah. You know, and that was, and th this was like maybe splitting up maybe $1,500 a week that I was making. We're mm -hmm. not talking about millions of dollars here. Right. When I say we made millions of dollars. It's the pure entrepreneurial endeavor where you're paying everyone more probably than you're paying yourself and putting in a lot 10 of time. times yeah, more oh, work. for sure. For sure. Yeah. I, I had plenty of, of waitresses and, and uh, people that worked at the front of the house mm -hmm. that made better money than I did. But the perspective is, oh, you're the owner. Because I've seen, yeah. I have friends who own businesses where they didn't pay themselves for months on end to make sure everyone else got paid. And we weren't, we weren't right people are like, limousines. but there's money, but it was just, it was the time of the year and what was due in taxes and what was yeah, due on equipment and all these different things. And it's like that that became some huge perspective to me. I learned how, so, how it bro. made a bigger difference to make to, to lease out a place. Mm -hmm. And although we, we had a very nice aesthetic to the place, to, to, the, to the, the, the bakery and the restaurant, yeah. it wasn't as glamorous as they may be thinking as, as it might have been, as yeah. I think it might have been. Cause I, I talk about, like, we had a driver. This is a friend of mine who was driving one of my cars that was a, you know, just a regular used car. Like, this is not... I think I paid like fifteen hundred dollars for that car. Right. You know, but you got a driver, <laughs> so yeah, I didn't have somebody to go off and drive. So at that time, at that moment, it's almost a, a choice of time for you, where you have more freedom to get things done while you're even driving. I learned how to Is organize that... it. Well, I, it was because I had to go off and get from one place to another place, and there were times when I would have to drive, like let's say my um, one of the trucks, mm -hmm. one of the because the, there was a couple different locations, so I might have to drive the delivery truck over to one of the other bakeries, and then have to go on deliveries. And then when I come back, I'm going to be dropping off that truck at one bakery. But you need I need my car, car there. So it's not like a driver like sitting back, oh, Alfred, <laughs> take me to here and stuff. <laughs> Just like rolling, that. lighting your cigars for you. And yeah, but, it, but, it, but that still sounds very impressive. 
It to sounds somebody. extravagant. It does probably sound to extravagant, your but it's not that much. You know, I was still having struggles to deal with with the law, having to pay this kind of fine or that kind of fine or yeah. whatever and stuff. Because I had a whole bunch of legal issues at the time, which is always fun. You know? it seems like it'd be a fun part of business too. A lot of them were parking or, or uh, speeding tickets, really, because I'm on my way from one baker to another. Uh, like, this is in Atlanta, and I'm. Sure. We have like, I'm like I gotta get there. It's a hundred miles an hour. I gotta get to this place <laughs> because it's really like a hundred miles away, and yeah. I need to be there in an hour. Hundred miles. That's an rough. Hour. That's you a, know, you should get a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! But then Man. they get really pissed if you're firing someone and you get a helicopter. Really, so, you know, yeah, I know. It's, it's I can hard. see. I can see how upset <laughs> they might be about that kind of stuff. That's. I was listening to Joe Rogan podcast and they he was talking about bill burr i guess picked him up in the helicopter <laughs> in la one day and like because he actually flies one oh, i'm like hey. oh, that's the life right there just take a helicopter through la which you live there i just came from there it's mm-hmm. like it's like oh it's 30 miles that'll be a good two hour drive yeah. that's not bad you know uh, it, but it it taught me how to go off and also how to 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 uh to delegate work mm-hmm. you know because i realized that when i couldn't do something myself there might be somebody else who can do it because my time might be worth more doing something else. Right. You know, and it might fit in their wheelhouse. Yeah, they might. That's where delegation really hits me. You know, where it's like this person might be way better at it than me. And the thing that would take me ten hours, sure, I could figure it out, but it took them an hour, and it's way better. Okay, why don't we figure out how you can actually like fuel that? And get it, them running. it took me many years after having left the bakery to mm-hmm. have a deeper understanding of why that's a good thing and how it can be good for both people. Yeah. Because I often hear nowadays where people talk about capitalism being a um, one-sided deal. Yeah. Where one person's profiting and the other person's losing out. And good business is when both people are profiting. Right. You know, good, long, sustainable business. And, yeah. And I think what you said in there, it's one, one-sided. And I think... Or the extreme idea of capitalism or the extreme idea of socialism. Mm -hmm. Um, It's like the nuances in between. What does it really look like to have a healthy capitalistic society, have a healthy entrepreneurial endeavor that actually cares about their employees? You know, I I think it's all in the middle of where the great conversation can happen. But then Mm -hmm. people just get so angry at any extreme, it seems like, to me. But You know, I mean, I think it, it, it almost becomes impossible to... To deal with people that are want that want to be stuck on one extreme or the other, right? You know? It really, it really is actually because there's I, no open door to have a conversation. Yeah, I mean, I, to, to myself, I feel like I'm one of the most charitable people that I that, that I know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I donate to everything from Wikipedia <laughs> to to the Red Cross to all kinds of stuff. Right. But I'm able to do that because I take care of my business. Right. Whereas most of my friends who are very upset in, about things and they're protesting things, right? They don't donate to anything. Yeah. They don't have the money to because they're barely paying the rent. Yeah, they're just kind of get by. Either not handling yeah. their business or I think one, one piece of it too is not everyone, it doesn't seem like everyone has the entrepreneurial kind of bent. I almost want to wanna say everybody does, they just don't realize it because everybody yeah. goes to work, you know? Well, everybody should, just all, almost everybody. Yeah, everybody work. should go to everybody work. Everybody should be going to work somehow <laughs> or another. But if they think of themselves as, a indivi- as their individual self as a business, uh-huh. then when they go in there to negotiate their, their pay, yeah. They would be thinking, how much is my time worth? Is this going to pay my, my bills that I have to pay? Mm-hmm. Just like I would think to myself, well, I can't sell you that cake for this amount of money because I have employees to pay for that cake. Right. I know how much that cake's going to cost to make. You know? So if people thought about that more often for themselves, they wouldn't get themselves stuck in positions where they're, they're almost going to screw themselves I, over from the beginning. I think that's where it comes to like the coaching, the mentoring. That's why it was oh, cool totally. to hear even like the two owners, shop owners of mm-hmm. the bakery. Um, coming alongside you, a lot of these conversations that I'm having with different artists and entrepreneurs that it always pops up that there was someone, uh, it was a mom or a grandma or a business owner, or another artist, someone who came along and coached them. And that seems to be such a huge thing. It's almost and, just reinforced all the time. Because yeah. from, from being a young kid, like I, I used to make money for fun. Like when I was acting and stuff, I didn't have bills to pay. Yeah. I, didn't, I made money for fun. That's fun. All right. When I, later on, I got into to one of the various types of things and some illegal uh, different kind of businesses you know but that 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 grew from doing stuff like selling lollipops selling yeah. candy selling so you're soda. like the pure bread yeah but i did that for fun i did it because i wanted to have some extra candy yeah you know and then i realized you know i, I did see later on that there weren't other people doing that kind of stuff but as I went through from being a computer programmer to like some of my illicit activities at the time to from selling candy to acting mm-hmm. to working in the bakery um, 
I, there was a time when I sold sunglasses. I did uh, back massages when I was a kid, actually, on set. I had, like, a little list of things. That's I brilliant, did. man. But I was just like, well, how much money can I make? To me, making money is a very easy thing to do. Yeah. I learned, I figure out, I see there's a problem, I solve the problem. Uh, if there's a service that needs to be made that, that I, you know, I would like to have made, mm -hmm. probably else, some, somebody else out there that would like to have their service done, you know? And as I started to work on my own projects, that's what has fueled me learning new things. It's because I want to know how to do this, or right. I want to know how to do that. Making money is easy to me, you know? Well, and that's what's cool about knowing a bit more of your story as we've gotten to talk is... Um, what is that? The other phone's upstairs. Oh, okay. It's all good. <laughs> I think the lapels probably didn't catch you. Probably, probably don't even hear that, I guess. But um, <laughs> so it seems like there's some people where those, those kind of things, they have a knack for it, so they just kind of build and build for themselves. But like you were talking about, you like now finding the people you can bet on and invest in. Um, talk to me a little bit more about the, the company you have where you're helping develop artists. Okay, so IMS. And this is, it's weird that I have so many companies that I'm running. <laughs> yeah, because right. you're a developing artist. Uh, you're working with SoFar I here in Vegas. So far. And then you have your own video company. I have a video production company. And then Actually, two of those now. Two video production Yeah, one that, that focuses on um, more like actual videography, and the other one does more like um, small stage production stuff, or gotcha. maybe um, like photography and stuff. More, more still, small, smaller scale stuff. Okay. So it's, it's weird they're, the way they're kind of split. But now, am I missing anything in there? Do you have oh, another? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of stuff. <laughs> You're I like, do. bro, I still have time left. What else are you up to? <laughs> um, so and then also, we'll get back also to the coaching artist. A couple of, uh, couple of books that I've written. So okay. it works out in the publishing thing. We're actually trying to go off and get more people to, to write more, to read more, and nice. work on that kind of stuff. Um, that company doesn't have a name yet, but it's working it on, it. work on it. I think there's now three books published under that. So that's the right. this, this year. Um, one of them happens to be with that company, with IMS. That's in the Indie Musician Services. And that okay. is. It's aimed at a, a, a group of, of musicians, essentially, because I found that online there was a lot of people that were teaching people how to be better musicians. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's awesome. But there comes a point, whether you're a musician or whatever you're doing, when you can't do everything yourself. Yeah. And what, I, what the IMS was supposed to be doing, what it is doing and working at doing, is connecting people with, with people to help each other so that they're having a better community amongst themselves because I, I find in places as like far as LA just partnering Atlanta, just with working. other artists or actually hiring like a team building well, the, a team the, real, around the realization that it's going to take a team right you know you can learn how to, to mix to record how to, to shoot your own videos how to do your own lighting how to do your own makeup mm -hmm. how to run your own live sound how to build your own guitar how to do all these different things but do you need to Right. You know, if you really want to, go ahead. I mean, the information's there. YouTube is there to go off and do that. And there are lots of teachers who will teach you, okay, well, this is how you have to think of your marketing aspects. This is how you have to think of, you know, what's the difference between advertising and marketing? Mm -hmm. All these things are there to be to learn. But, and while I do pass on a lot of that kind of stuff, teach people how to tour properly, how to plan their tour, yeah. whatever it may be, um, there's also times when you just need someone else to actually help you do it. And that's what I try to go off and do is connect people that, that are oh, okay. going to need so, one service to other people who provide those kinds so of services. So it's almost like a broker of relationships in a way for well, it's artists. Like, it's, and it's such a great thing that I see on the net now is that we have the ability to reach out to people that are all over the place. Absolutely. And it's a very small group of artists who are doing that. And those are the ones who are doing things more effectively. Like mm -hmm. They don't care that they live in Australia. They can hit up a mixer who lives in New York. Right. You know? When I go off and I talk to my friends, I'm not limited by the people that are just standing right next to me, my left and my right. You can connect you know. them. It's like, hey, there's a dude in Chicago. I know somebody in Seattle, Atlanta that, that, that I can hit up from the BMI office to get another placement for that TV sync because that, awesome. that song would sound great for this. Yeah. You know, because I think on a, on a bigger scale on that kind I of stuff. I dig it, man. You know, it's not just about me trying to sell like a coaching service. You see that a lot mm -hmm. on, 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 uh, on yeah. right now. Yeah, I get exhausted by the amount of coaching opportunities I, I even have I have some friends who just launched uh, their own which I've gone through is is really helpful uh, the difference with them that I told them versus a lot of the other ones I've seen is all the things they're teaching are not just like stuff they pulled it's stuff that they've learned through pain over the last 20 years mm -hmm. and now they're distilling real which is things. great that is great um, 
but it just seems like there's a plethora of people just there's out so there. Many. Like, and again, it's just the coaching as opposed to, or I can connect you to these people for a good five thousand dollars extra. You know, that's and, true. You know, and I <laughs> I try to stay out of that. Like, I'm there to go off and actually make legitimate connections with people because I'm right. building businesses, and in a way that that helps. Uh, working with another one of my things, which is a record label that I work with. Yeah. And it's a very limited record label. It's very selective where I go off and pull somebody in to work with them on stuff. Mm. But having now built find up... Find the right a, person to bet on. Yeah, and find the right yeah. people to bet on. You know? <laughs> but that changes how I looked at record labels. Because mm-hmm. I got signed to a record label back when I was like 20-something. And I, I got out of it because I didn't understand why they were marketing me to 12-year-olds. <laughs> you know? You're like, this is not my target demo, yeah, guys. I'm not, why am What's I, going why on? Why are you guys trying to get me this? And then at the time, I realized that I mean, you notice how, how much younger I look now, but when I was yeah. 20, I was easy to sell to a preteen. Right. You know, and I could see how they were trying to do me almost like a Justin Bieber or, or something like that at the time. It but made it wasn't more sense. your vibe. I didn't understand that. Yeah. I didn't understand that, well, later on, I can make a bunch of money from that and then go invest that in something else. <laughs> yeah. You know, all the artists do that. They completely change over and do entirely different stuff right. than they did when they were originally put out, you know? Yeah, like make tequila or yeah. Yeah, so whatever. <laughs> I... I I was mystified by that, you know, just that whole process. And mm-hmm. I got into doing production because I was upset with those record labels. Now I'm looking at myself as a record label and I'm thinking to myself, all right, well, I got eight hours in the day that I really want to devote to music. Mm-hmm. But who do I want to devote it to? Because right. I can mix, I can record, I can play 50 instruments, I do production, I can, you know, go on. And I got another company that'll do the video production side of stuff. I got another company that does marketing. Yeah. So if, if I'm working on these things, I could do a lot of this stuff in house. But how much do I really want to invest in this in particular person? And I find that there's less of them. So it makes me a lot more selective, which makes me seem like an asshole. Right. But I think, <laughs> I think to you know? guard that in the end, I think it adds more value to the people you do work with. Yeah, totally. Because um, I've seen working with different agents and managers, all different, different things where there's some where they'll just almost sign anyone, but you realize that's just part of their strategy. And they kind of see... What hits, and it's a business strategy. I get you know, it. I can't argue with it. It's working out for them. Um, but then I also see other people who are very selective, and it, then again, long term, it seems like the better play because well, I you're, you're, I think it makes you're building anyway. your own brand by doing that too, where you're saying, "No, this is what I'm about." And, and I, when I see my, my successful people that I look up to, because mm-hmm. that's what I, I constantly do is I look to the people that I look up to and say, "What what worked well for them? Right? What did good for them?" You know, when I see think of people like Barry Gordy or somebody like that from the, the Motown era. Yeah. Like, he was picking people, and he's like, no, we're going to make this. You know, he had, he had a, a pretty strong Actually hold on how he artists. wanted to be. Yeah. That worked really well. Motown put out Yeah, they did hundreds. all right. They did all right, I'd <laughs> say. It's songs, you know? <laughs> and I want, I want to be successful. I, I want to go off and be able to put things down that are going to, to have some lasting, mm-hmm. you know, effort into it. I don't want to just have, like, a one-hit type yeah. of thing, you know? So when I try to work with artists, that's, that's the, the type of mentality I'm, I'm having cool. them think about what they're doing. Are, when you're writing that song, is this a song that you think is, you know, are you just going to put down 10 songs that are all throwaways mm-hmm. just to make 10 songs? Are you going to work really hard on one of them? Right. You're gonna work really, and if you're going to work really hard on one of them, knowing when to quit is a good, time, is a good thing too, you know? <laughs> and just learning that kind of stuff. Let the baby be born. Yeah, let, let it go, go into. Man. Well, it's, I uh, really want to do a full-length album with my previous band, when we did our first like in studio thing and the producer kept trying to say, don't do a full length album. You don't want to just get a few songs and put everything into it. And I was like, mm-hmm. no, we're doing, I want to, cause there's that artist thing. Like, I know. no, it feels good. And he's like, I'm telling you, we went back and forth and uh, he, he's always been very honest. That's why we still work together to this day. He's always been very honest with me, but then kind of willing to back up my own vision mm-hmm. as well. So we did a full length album. That's and it, it didn't turn out as great as I wanted it to, of course, because we didn't have the time that we should have had. So came time to record the next thing, and he's like, so, what you thinking? You want to you do another <laughs> full-length album? <laughs> and no, we ended up like six songs on that one, and, but putting everything we could into each one. And I wrote 60 songs, and we distilled it down yeah, to six. Down. And so even that process was like, oh, okay, now we're really digging in. And then, yeah, it was like night and day after releasing that versus our full length. But because I just had this thing in my mind that that's what I was supposed to do. But, but yeah, put more into it. it. It's 
It what really it's what really changed me. And when I saw I went back to, to school, I went back to Berkeley to go off and study songwriting. When I left the bakery, right I, I got really deep. Berkeley, in, uh, California, uh, or no, Berkeley Boston. Yeah, school in, and Boston. Okay, right right I was doing it all online though, so I didn't. I went and lived right in on. Boston at the, on the campus up there. But didn't, I learned. Didn't add an extra state. Into yeah, <laughs> and add another one into it, man. It's too cold up there. I don't know yeah. if I, can, I can't handle. I think you chose wisely before. out this direction. Yeah, this feels. I feel pretty solid out here. This is October. It looks like a nice day out. Yeah, it's pretty you nice know. out. It's not bad. So I was actually, just in Provo yesterday, though. It was a little chilly. Yeah, I was it like, is. Yeah, I already I feel it. like it's cold now. I, that's why I think. Like I'm like, I probably need to leave the country. You know, <laughs> I need to go somewhere else where I can deal with the weather being a little bit warmer and nicer for me. Sometimes, yeah, man. You know, but the the thing that really drove it home for me or drove things home for me with the the whole thing at, at Berkeley was that I had to be a craftsman and that was being not just being an artist mm -hmm. and not just being some rigid engineer yeah you know like oh this is how it's got to be this is the structure this is how it has to look but finding that that beautiful middle ground on right. things you know where I was like I'm kind of restricted but I'm kind of pushing the envelope it's know? almost like how you've merged like artistry and business in the same way because so business so. is going to be way more concrete almost the engineering side mm -hmm. of it and it seems like that's where people get tripped up where they're overly business and it sucks the life out of the yeah, art that's not good. or they're right just all edge. artists and they have no right sense of edge. what business is yeah uh, i think it was mark twain who said you know being genius is trying to see where everybody's wanting to go mm -hmm. and then getting there first nice but it's not about just going everywhere because there's a time and place to get to all these places where it's right. going to work out well for. I see it often with artists who came before their time. They mm -hmm. put out a whole bunch of music that's amazing, but, but there just, wasn't a market for it yet. Right. I'm glad that they put the, the, the music out, but I feel really bad that they died poor or that mm -hmm. they weren't able to capitalize on it or whatever. That, that sucks. It really sucks. Yeah, and know? sometimes it's just artists shooting themselves in, the, in their, okay, their own feet, go. like where it's going. Oh, that's your oh, phone. That one. Oh, okay. You need it? No, no. It's oh, okay. Yeah, it <laughs> I was just wondering if it was mine. I heard you going <laughs> I know, it's too, too many it phones. Like, so all these phones. phones. Um, yeah, and I should have, like, total freshman move. I didn't even turn off my ringer. I don't even know what I'm thinking. <laughs> but, well, that's awesome, though, man. Um, I love digging into, like, the philosophical end as well, like, behind artistry and behind, like, all these entrepreneurial thoughts. So, so thinking of the concept of living a great life, in the midst of all the things you got going on. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you right now to live a great life? Like I'm happy. Like, and this, that's a, a strange thing to hear. Like I'm, I'm very happy with my life. What's interesting, you say it's strange, but almost everyone I've talked to, that's when I ask the question, that's where they start. And I mean that in a good way. Mm -hmm. Like it's been kind of inspiring to hear, but anyways, I'll let you <laughs> no, unpack no, no, it. it. <laughs> it's a commonality between people that are enjoying what they're doing. Mm -hmm. it's, I don't want to be like just a factory guy working in, in something that I, that I hate, that I dislike right. immensely. The, the reason I do all this stuff is because I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. You know, The reason I, I'm going to go play in some 3D software later, doing some motion capture that I'm working on for an animation, for a animated series for next year, the reason I'm going to do that is because I was doing something else before that mm -hmm. that brought me to it, but that I enjoyed that just as much. Now it's I'm excited like, this to is cool. with this. Oh, that could be a cool kind you of know? thing. Yeah. That's... What I would love to see from more people, because most of the time when I meet people, they tell me about, oh man, my job sucks, <laughs> my wife or my, my, my boyfriend or whatever, yeah. they, they, I hate them or whatever, bad stuff going on with their family, or they're mm. having you know, drug problems or they're whatever, they're having, all right. kinds of problems they're having. But they're very unhappy, unhappy with their lives. Yeah, and it happens all too often. I'm like, well, why, why? Why are you living a life that you're unhappy with? You know, and because I, I, I strive to be happy in my life, mm. it makes things easier. You know, after that, the next thing out is I'm trying to help other people to be happy because it sucks to be the half person in the room and everybody else is sad. <laughs> that seems like the natural thing is you want to help other people be happy. That's, I keep coming back to J. Cole, but uh, his song, Middle Child. Have you heard oh, this? I'm, I'm familiar with this. I love J. Cole, obviously, but that's what I love. It's all about like, I'm where I want to be, but it's no fun if I'm the only one sitting in first class. You know, and that way. raising up his brothers around him to like be in that place with him. So that's cool, man. To not only strive for your own personal happiness, but finding helping other people find. Well, I the can't be happy when, when other people are, are miserable about stuff. Right. You know, it's very difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. um, through a lot of meditation, I've had to, to accept like, okay, well, you know what? 
accept that you're happy. Accept that there's other people that have made some choices that make them yeah. unhappy. Which you can't be responsible you know, for. Yeah, I can't be responsible for. Other I think I've choices. sometimes I've put too much responsibility on myself for other people's happiness and realizing like I can do what I can, but yeah. Anyway, I spent Buku's you know. money trying to help other people on stuff. I, <laughs> when I say I had myself cars and stuff, I bought other people's cars. Uh-huh. I bought other people homes. Before I had my own. Yeah. This is when I was renting my own home. And, and then people were like, hey, I need to get some money for this down payment. I was like, all right, well, I'll give you my savings to get your right. house. And then they That's screw it up. Help. You know, when right. I buy people houses and stuff, when I gave people jobs that they, you know, to, to set themselves up and they're like, the first day they come in and they're like, hey, I got to go home, man. I, my back kind of hurt. What are you talking about? I just, like, you've been begging for a job for a year. <laughs> like, bro, that's not how this works. You know, I'm sitting up here at the top of stuff. There's like, Several managers beneath me. You can't just come in here like to to tell me this yeah. ridiculousness. Well, and I think it's you know? about for me. I keep coming back to this concept of ownership. Like if I can have, there's a book that I read last year that keeps coming back to me all the time. It's called Extreme Ownership. I can't remember the name of the guy who mm-hmm. wrote it, but he was a he he led the Navy SEALs like all their stuff in like Fallujah, and it just talks about his concepts of of being in the SEAL teams, and but it's this idea that literally everything is your fault and your responsibility. And coming from, it's, there are some things that's just hard to get my mind around that, but all in all, it's like seen around, like if I'm not happy, it's my fault. Mm-hmm. So now there almost a, there's almost a power there though, because if it's my fault, yeah, my I fault. can change it. Mm-hmm. But if it's not your fault, then you're just a victim. You can't change that. And, I said and that's there are a things. huge... There are things that are, are, that are out of my control. Right. And know? that is and true. Understanding like, that's there's abuse. Thing. There's, there's certain things that are bigger. But seeing that that's... line, mm-hmm. you know, it's like that, that prayer. I'm not, I'm not a Christian now myself, but yeah. when I think of that, that serenity prayer, which actually oh, isn't a Christian prayer anyway. But anyway, Right, yeah. That's, that's, it's kind yeah. of been adopted, I think, yeah. for a lot of different religions. But that, that whole, you know, accepting... accepting uh, some things can't be your way, except that some things can be, and ha- mm-hmm. learning, you know, learning the difference is the wisdom <laughs> no, on that. It's a, it's a very, imp- it's a good thing to have. I enjoy having that wisdom to know that there are certain things that are out of my control, right? But that there's other things that are in my control, and having a little bit more clarity on what is in my control changed my outlook on life. Yeah, it made me a good. lot less pessimistic about stuff because there was a time when I was growing up, and I, I think this happens to a lot of kids, like they're very optimistic, like the world is is open. Right. And then it's Wide-eyed. like everybody steps on you and says, no, you can't do this. You can't do that. This is impossible. That's not going to be, you know, mm-hmm. that's not even plausible. That's not real. That's a fake dream. Right. You know, all these things. And that knocks people down makes them very pessimistic. I felt for a long time, I was like, man, it just seems rough. All that stuff keeps playing in your brain. Everything's bad, man. There's exactly. No and I've lived from having, when, when my parents were living down in uh, Mexico and Panama, we had house servants and stuff. We had a nice, nice life. Mm-hmm. This a, they were diplomats and stuff. Like, nice. It was really nice going off and then moving to L.A. when we lived in the ghetto. I was living in South Central at the time. I've seen, where, you know, on both sides like of those, those types pictures, of things. Yeah. You know, and I realized that they're, you know, we're all people. Mm-hmm. We're all just people, man. You know, but a lot of times, a lot of times, the decisions that we're making, and sometimes we don't even know we're making those decisions, mm-hmm. were very effective on what, what, what the outcome was, you know, a couple years later. Right. Not to mention decades later. Yeah. You know, because now at 34, although I have been with a lot of friends all over the country, I see the paths that they took, you know, and things that worked out well for them and how things have worked out well for me. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of my friends are not with me anymore, you know, from those times when, when they made some, some bad choices and yeah. some of those bad choices left them to die. You wow. Know? I was in some, I had some of those same choices. I had probably more choices than them sometimes because I would make choices. I'd put myself in situations where how did this happen? How did I get into this situation to make? You look back now, we're like, glad I made it out of that kind of yeah, deal. Yeah, but I did make it out because I made good decisions. Right. You know, and there were, it was very rarely that it was left up to chance. So most of the time, it's because I made the right decision. Mm-hmm. You know, did I, did I just, when I'm sitting there, I'm like, mm, maybe should I stick this needle in my arm or not? And I said, <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Which I saw a lot that of one that. decision. That's a big decision. Is a huge trajectory. That can change a lot of stuff. Absolutely. You know? But I remember when I was a kid growing up and going to D.A.R.E. and all this kind of stuff, and they lied to me over and over and what about was? stuff. When I, to D.A.R.E., like the D.A.R.E. program, it was a, uh, a, a D.A.R.E. against yeah, a, a resistance or whatever. I, I don't case. remember exactly what it yeah, means, drug but abuse what were they lying about? They lied about how bad everything was, how there was going to be people that were going to be trying to offer me drugs at every <laughs> I see. They may sound like, like, don't go to that party because they'll be like, hey, here's some meth. 
Yeah, you know, and I didn't. I got you. And, you know, that made me distrust them. I wish, mm. what I wish that they had done is been more honest with me. You know, I wish they had talked to me more and, and told me more about what was really happening and yeah. these truths instead of trying to, on one hand, tell me how meth is a terrible thing and then try to give me a whole bunch of meth pills because I think I have ADHD or, or ADD or whatever. Yeah. You know, because I saw a, hip, a lot of hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Or when they, when they told me, oh, you know, hey, marijuana is what's going to be the worst thing for you out here. This is it's the be, gateway drug. Yeah, it's gonna be, this is what's really going to set fire to everything. And I'm thinking to myself. Like, no, it's actually just going to bring in a lot of state revenue. Yeah, is what. you know, <laughs> all these kinds of things that I saw, you know, I, I, I would, was mystified by how blatantly wrong they were about some things and how they could have done it correctly to prevent me from having problems that I ran into in mm -hmm. reality, in the real world. Yeah. Because they made it look like reefer madness and it wasn't like that. Right. It was very different. And if they thought that that was like an adult conversation to have that I shouldn't be having as a kid, they were wrong. It's like just have an authentic conversation from the beginning. Yeah, that, that yeah. would have been a whole lot better because I think that, that when it was their time for me for learning about drugs or for sex or for mm. a lot of stuff, it was way later than the times that I needed to have that education. <laughs> no, that makes sense. You know, like they, they got it wrong. Mm -hmm. They thought I needed to have drug education at the end of middle school or in, in high school? Need no. like fifth grade? Yeah, much younger. We could have been talking about these things way That's younger. That's true. I would have understood what was going on with my parents better. Right. I would have understood what was going on with my friends who, who got caught up in all kinds of stuff a lot mm -hmm. better. You know, I would have understood why my one of my best friends who, by the time we were in eighth grade, he was addicted to heroin. Wow. Because... That's crazy. Well, by it was because he, he had to start taking opiates. Hmm. But it started from... The pills that they said were okay, because what wow. a doctor gives you is good. Right. What the guy on the street gives you is bad. Exactly. But that's not true. They should have been more honest about it in the first place and told us, hey, you know what? There's a lot of drugs that even your doctors are going to give you or mm. try to give you that are bad. It's but like it doesn't just because something's legal doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> that's true. Or illegal doesn't or, mean yeah. it's necessarily bad. You know, no, there, there was a very but that that disingenuous. What I consider was just lying. They were just lying to us. Yeah. Messed up things that could have been better for me. I, I could have had a better trajectory on something. I'm happy with my trajectory. Just as far as what you, in a sense, do you feel like you've just been more prepared for the things that you faced? I was Because you feel, it sounds like you've made the good choices. I made choices some good choices. Along the way. But. I made some good choices. I made some mm -hmm. bad choices, you know, and... If I had made, if I had had better education, mm -hmm. I would have had better choices that I could have made because I would have had, I've been, would have been equipped with better knowledge. Gotcha. So maybe move forward faster in, yeah. in life than you. Things did would have happened much different. I want to say they wouldn't have been perfect. They, I, I don't think they would have been perfect. Right. But they would have been better, and that's what I try to go off and pass on to other people. I pass on those experiences and the knowledge that I have, not just what somebody told me or what what I you know, the, the indoctrinating type of propaganda that somebody wants me to pass on. Right. But something that I know I feel is absolutely right. Like the real practical you know? steps. And how am I going to get somebody, I, I talked about this with my girlfriend a lot, but I, I thought mm -hmm. about what everybody ended up consulting is that I'm trying to help people get where they're going faster, mm -hmm. you know? And most people are not just trying to get to their grave faster. You know, I want to get people to... <laughs> to this happiness. Yeah. To so find a place you know, of contentment, happiness, It makes things joy work what so they much do. easier. Like I need to... to uh, to make my business work well, mm -hmm. I have to work with other people. Yeah. And other people need to be happy and working. It sucks to work with somebody who's angry about stuff all the time. <laughs> yeah, because even mm -hmm. if you can pay them really well, that's not going to last. No. Like, even if you're paying them really well, they're going to find somewhere else where, like, you know, it's a little less, but I'm out. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sticking around. So I want to make it have a long-term, right. you know, workable type of solution to me, you know, that, that's going to have a, um, an outcome that's favorable to both of us. Yeah. Because that's that's how it actually works. <laughs> it doesn't work the other way. <laughs> not in the long run, anyway. Right. You end up, like you said, like you were saying, you know, shooting yourself in the foot or screwing yourself over in the. I in see the long it all run too run. often. I've done it many times along the along this journey of the artistry. But it seems like artists have a special knack. Uh, I don't know if it's the narcissism because it's there. Like, it's I, the I, I, yeah, the the ego is probably a, the a less negative word because I remember uh, we were on tour with my last band and my bass player. He's like, yeah, people talk about like, oh, you have an ego. He's like, I don't, I don't want to project that on people. But the reality is, is like all of us in this industry have the audacity to like create things mm -hmm. and stand in front of human beings and say, hey, look at me. Of course, we're going to struggle with 
our egos and so, narcissistic this is, this tendencies and all on those things. Uh, I had a, uh, a guy who's actually from ASCAP. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry with BMI, but mm. he, just, he just actually recently died. A guy named Ralph Murphy. Fantastic lecturer guy. He's just, but he was the president of ASCAP for a long mm. time for, for the publishing company. And in the lectures that he gives, uh, which I've watched so many times because it's just such a good lecture, he, he says, you know, as musicians, we think it's all about us. Mm -hmm. We want to explain how we feel. Right. But the reality is that that's what it's about. What it's about is, is how other people feel. Mm -hmm. It's that story, it's that connecting story to, to, to people. Instead, it's not just about, hey, well, this is how I feel, this is how it goes You can do that in me, your blah, basement. Blah, blah, blah. You can play that song for yourself yeah. in your basement. He said, he said there's a time <laughs> and place for that. Right. You know, in the back of a bar, it's a dark place, people are drunk and it's smoky. That's a great place to have a, you know, a, a moody, sad in my feelings kind type of, of deal. place. Right. Cool. Go for it. You know, there's that album that's great for doing that. Like, mm -hmm. But most of the time, most of the time people want to listen to a song to make them feel better. And he, he related it back to blues and stuff. He mm -hmm. says, you know, most of the time when you listen to blues, blues is not sad music. Mm -hmm. Blues is to keep you from being sad. Yeah. It's about being sad, but you, he ends up, he makes fun. Because they're usually very humorous songs. Yeah, you make fun of, of stuff. Like, kind of, whatever. Like, I had a shitty day, and this was my shitty day was about, and you're laughing by the end of it. I just saw an artist last night kind of do the same thing where he's just talking mm -hmm. about him driving down the highway, something completely mundane, but the way he viewed it was hilarious, and it was all that's set That's what we're blues. supposed to be sharing as artists. Yeah. And that's what I think of myself as an artist when I'm working out. It's strange that I do all this other stuff, and then I'm like a musician trying to do this stuff. <laughs> yeah, we haven't even got to that part right, yet. <laughs> you know? I, I'm trying to be of service to other people to make them feel better. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think Peter Frampton said it really well when he says, I'm not trying to make somebody feel something specific. I just want to make them feel something. Hmm. And I, so I'm out there trying to do that because I feel like if I, as long as I'm making them feel something, yeah. you know, then I'm moving them forward. Then I'm not, it, it seems like I might be about making money because when you're being of service to people, when you're playing songs that they want to hear or you're, you're, right. you're doing whatever, it seems like you're, you're just selling out. Mm -hmm. That's not true. And when you listen to older artists who have been in the, in the game for a long time, yeah. they say they do it for their fans. Yeah. You know, they love doing it, obviously, especially if they're really old. And if you're you not know? making money, you can't keep doing they it. They can't keep that's doing the, it, you know? That's the piece. But yeah. I, I take care of all my business stuff long beforehand. Yeah. That way I can enjoy doing what I'm doing because I love playing music. It's mm. great. But if I can do that and make other people happy, yeah. then that makes it a sustainable business. That's the whole service industry right there in, in a nutshell. It's one person doing something for somebody else. That's true. You know, in exchange for money. That is the whole idea behind that, that whole business. Yeah. And that, that makes music be less of a product mm -hmm. and more of a service. And that's where I feel like we are going in the future. Well, that's Even what's interesting to me out. about, like, so far. That's one reason I love that as an entity mm -hmm. and what you guys are doing here. I've, I haven't got to see a Vegas so far yet, but, like, just did one in Portland and got to see Seattle's. And oh, okay. it's, like, those intimate gatherings. Like, it comes back to this maybe, maybe service, but I, I think of it as experience where yeah. it's, like, it's getting back to like creating a real experience. And I think in this, I love all the digital stuff, all the digital marketing things and social media. I, I really do. Mm -hmm. But I think because that's becoming such the forefront of really everything, it's like now there's this hunger again for people to want to connect. They want to hear your stories. Where like then one of the so far as I did, I didn't talk as much and felt like it was kind of a miss because it seemed like, you could tell as you interacted with fans, it's like they wanted to hear more of that particular thing. You know, like they wanted to know the why behind it. So mm -hmm. it's like, oh, so I can't miss that. That's in this environment. That's what they're wanting, you know. And yeah, service, so it's that yeah. service, that experience. And that's what I love about it. That's yeah, awesome. I mean, as, as I delve deeper into filmmaking and stuff as a director mm -hmm. here, I'm, I'm looking at things from a different perspective as well. It's, it's definitely about storytelling. Yeah, you know whether it's creating an experience in virtual reality or you're creating an experience, you know, right in front of somebody, it's about, that kind of stuff is not getting going away from automation. Mm -hmm. You know, autom people enjoy having experience in life. People don't right. want to just go to work. They come home. They do this. They have to do that. They want to have the extracurricular side. They want yeah. that entertainment. That's what we. That's what creates culture. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have what defines a, or a society, their culture. Is what they do in their free time, yeah. you know, and how we how we decide to spend that kind of free time, and that's something that I feel like we're getting more and more of if we if we angle this out right. Because I know other people that are working, like I was, they're mm -hmm. working you know sixty hours a week, but they're working for somebody else or maybe mm -hmm. a couple of extra jobs and stuff. I feel bad for them on that. Mm -hmm. But as we get into a point where we can actually automate our 
our work, I feel like we're getting to a point where it's, it's almost like an artist revolution now. Hmm. Across the board, whether you're an engineer, an architect, you're, whether you're making films or yeah. you're doing podcasts, it doesn't matter what you're doing. It's an artistic way of looking at things because now it's not just about, oh, well, I made a CD. It's about, people buy the CD as an afterthought. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I tell people about... If they even buy it, like, yeah, what's a CD buy it, anymore? I you know? don't know, but... See, I, <laughs> I'm I try to, yeah, no, no, no. I, I try to go off and get people to go off and figure out, well, how can you make that product be special? If you're right. going to sell a product, it's going to have to be special. Mm -hmm. So there's times when I tell people, okay, well, you know what? Your, your best strategy on this is to put some of your songs on Spotify mm -hmm. and then put some album-only songs on this album. That That's smart, yeah. You know, or make it make it be a special release remix of it on on vinyl over here. Right. Make it be because that's we're what I'm doing. Uh, I just sell USB drives now, where it has all the all the music videos and all the music, even stuff I haven't released yet, to where it's like all there. Plus, they have a USB drive now that's branded that they can use anytime. And that that's was the one. Thinking. Like some people were like, "That's cool," because honestly, I don't use CDs, but. I can listen to your music and now I have this thing. <laughs> it's like, all right, I just experimented with it, but it's it seems to be going really well. But yeah, finding yeah. different ways to engage. I think where you say the music revolution, I feel like even this this idea about how you sell music, I think the opportunities are there. People just have to start thinking differently mm -hmm. instead of bitching about, oh, the royalties aren't the same. See, I feel it's like, like that hurts where are the opportunities? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like it hurts, honestly. When I, because I, I think back to the artists that maybe came in maybe 100 years ago. Mm. They didn't make that money, much money off selling albums either. Yeah, it's right? traditionally they never have. All right, so that's not, that's not like a new <laughs> thing. Because people talk about how, oh, well, artists used to make a lot of money on this. And I'm thinking, not in the 20s, not in the 30s, not in the 40s. <laughs> like I'm trying to remember when. When was this? When were artists doing really, really well selling their own CDs? Yeah. Or albums or tapes or anything? Because I can't remember that time. Yeah, the bulk of it has been live and been licensing. playing live shows. Yeah, and mm -hmm. well, and sync stuff, and they get yeah. the, you know stuff from record labels and stuff. Like that. Actually, honestly, in that case, I actually thank the record labels because they did a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, you know, to to put out the groundwork. In the past hundred years, record labels have made so much headway. Not to, yeah. we're not even talking about the gear they've created or has been created because mm -hmm. of them or any of that. That's a whole other plethora of stuff that they've done, but. They've actually laid the groundwork to make the business actually be viable, mm -hmm. you know. And thinking about, okay, well, we got to set up a tour, we got to have a promo shot, we got to have this, that, whatever. Kind of paved the way, yeah. and and now in a new generation, you don't necessarily need them now. But I think it is what it is, and it's like if you want to reach a large audience in a short period of time, and you need someone to pony up a shit ton of cash, mm -hmm. there's your option. There, but I, I when someone's that. putting that behind you, there's costs. Yeah, you know, but so they're easy, not but, the enemy. But it necessarily. is cheaper now to make an album oh, than yeah. it was even just fifty years ago. Right, way cheaper. Mm -hmm. And you could conceivably do do it in your own bedroom mm -hmm. on an iPad. You, yeah, you could. <laughs> you know, with better technology than they had when the Beatles were recording. So, like in my phone. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it is it is, to me. I feel like things have gotten so much better. Right. You know, it's, it's gotten hard to make a buck trying to sell something that you weren't going to make that much money doing anyway. Mm -hmm. But the problem I see, and I have to talk to a lot of artists with, where, and this is where I divulge a lot from them, is that they shouldn't really be caring about trying to make new laws that are going to be, mm -hmm. in the end, self-defeating. Yeah. Like, there, there's the laws that have come out for the royalties and stuff where there's been copyright infringements and stuff, problems like this that we're facing. Now. Like the ones where they're, like, suing other people because they stole their music? Yeah, where the sounds like this one. It drives me insane. Because I think it's to myself... It's so frustrating. I'm very upset about this because we've been, we're supposed to steal. We're, yeah. Well, that, like, uh, artists, you're influenced, and that's the thing is most of those artists, I don't think... Sam Smith was like, ooh, going to rip off that Tom Petty song. Sam Smith was probably listening to Tom Petty when oh, he was works. growing up, <laughs> and it was in his brain, and they're, they're, jiving, like, they're just hanging out in the studio, and this thing comes out because you're influenced by it. Yeah, to me, it's, it's kind of like a note from the corporate world where a lot of, a lot, like the cell phone companies, like I, I watched a graph one day tracing all the lawsuits, that mm. cell phone companies are doing. I mean, it just goes oh, all over the place. But it's part of their business strategy now. Because it's like, if I can tie up this company in a bunch of different lawsuits, that's less resources and less time that they have, and maybe we can run just a little bit further. Where I'm, I feel like that's where the record companies are going because it's, it's getting tougher for them. So now they're just looking 
Because I don't even think it's, it, it might be, but I don't think it's the actual artists. It's the people who own all the publishing well, even who are coming at them. And, and honestly, because of the ind independent artists mm -hmm. who don't have the litigation or the, the legal teams behind them right. to tell them why this is not going to be a good idea, mm -hmm. they've actually created a lot of these problems for us now. So now yeah. when I decide I want to up upload a cover of a song onto mm -hmm. YouTube, it's going to get flagged. Oh, yeah. Because so many independent artists were out there saying, no, I got to get my... 0 0.001 cent <laughs> off a of play, yeah. and it's like, no, man. You, well, it's you like the people I know who don't want to put their stuff on Spotify, but they're an unknown artist. Like, it's like that's where everyone's listening to music, mm -hmm. and so you you got your extra fifty bucks, or how many extra fans long term? Mm -hmm. And back to like, I had a, I saw another artist bring this up on Facebook, and a manager I know he manages a band called Brazilian Twins, a great great act who's like coming up right now. And, and he put out there, he's like, I spent, I forget what the numbers were, but how much he spent on going to live shows the last year mm -hmm. versus how much he spent on like subscriptions and those kind of things where he's like, there's your opportunity, like live events, live experiences thing. And really that's where a lot of artists were really making their money previously before this whole revolution. So yeah, yeah. I, I agree <laughs> with you. I think, I think the opportunities are endless. And what I also think that my frustration, you, this hits on some chords for me, but my frustration is a lot of independent artists like, that are like me, where we're just getting out there, just starting to tour, just starting to release music. They're, they're angry and they're bitching about these, these like high-end things. Well, there's no, there's no big record deals anymore. You, you have to be fully developed before a record label ever wants to touch you, all these things. It's like... In the past, yeah, that existed, but there wasn't as much of a middle class, if you will, mm -hmm. as far as it was either you were doing nothing or you were the big artist, but to... It looks like it grew to me. Yeah, anything in between, it didn't seem... It, it was like that pipe dream where I think now I see artists after artists creating their own businesses all along the way. And you... Because so, it's, it's like the NFL. It's like getting in the NFL if you want to be a multi-platinum recording artists, mm -hmm. not saying you can't do it, not saying I don't want that, that would be amazing. And J. Cole was, was kind yeah. of that way. <laughs> but, but, yeah, or yeah, like, look at Nipsey Hussle. He never had a thing on radio. Yeah, yeah. But he built an incredible business where it's like, or Tech 9 from Kansas City, right? Yeah. He's like, <laughs> they, they built this thing all along the way and they didn't need this big pipe dream. Mm -hmm. They built it step by step. And the my, I mean, I don't know them personally, but my guess is they're happier because they got to no, no, call tech, the shots. Tech, tech is happy. Yeah, Tech's happy with where he's at and doing and stuff. And see, so like, you're calling the shots all along the way. You get to make the decisions you want along the way. No doubt, learning and getting mentoring, but again, you're not. You see, you know, TLC declared bankruptcy after Crazy Sexy. Yeah, there's a lot of them. You know, <laughs> Google do that. Their their fifth album w with their first number one hit on it after five albums was name, they declare bankruptcy right after that. It's like, I don't think a lot of them were happy at that point where they eventually restructured their deals and, and probably doing much better in life now, but that's, that's a reality of like, oh, you want the big record deal, which could be cool, and maybe it's helpful to somebody, but there's opportunity all along the way, and it, that piece, I think, is way easier now. But people are shooting themselves in the foot. Mm -hmm. Long before they get the chance to, to live the life they could be, they're messing yeah. it up for themselves on stuff. What do you because think like, is the main um, thing? Because I think that they think that money is an enemy. Mm -hmm. They think that the big record companies are the enemy. Right. They think that there has to be an enemy in the first place. Yeah. Um, whereas to me, when I think of this stuff, like like uh, Paola. Mm -hmm. When Paola got made illegal here in the U.S., I forget what, what year it was, but it was in, in the last hundred years or whatever. When it Paola was, got, I think, wasn't it in the 70s? In the 70s? They made it illegal? I, I'm not yeah, really somewhere sure. I'm just going to pull that you know? out of my ass. No, no, no. I know it was on um, 40,000 <laughs> Somewhere in stuff, there. But they, it was illegal essentially to, to pay for, for mm. radio placement. It's like, hey, spend this a lot. Here's the extra cash. And yeah. But what happened was this, when we made that illegal, mm -hmm. we got rid of the money side of things. Yep. All right? On it, technically. Supposedly. On technically. <laughs> right, but what really <laughs> happened is that instead of money then being the commodity, which is great. I love my, money being a commodity because it should be. Yeah. We're not going to get into why money is not a good commodity in the U.S. because of the way they print it and the Fed and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, That'll we'll be a whole other that podcast, that's whole, right? Yeah, it's a whole different side of things. But the idea is when you pull out the money side of things, then another commodity comes into play, and that's power. 
Mm -hmm. And that's why now when you go to Atlanta or New York or L.A. or you're here in Las Vegas, you get the same playlist mm -hmm. because it's owned by the same people. Yeah. You know, you get these master playlists that get put together where now you can't, it, it, you can't go off and pay anybody to get in. Yeah. No, we're starting to say, well, now, I just saw somebody today, because I had to snapshot it on my, or a screenshot on my phone, where someone was saying that they, they shouldn't be able to pay somebody to put their name on a playlist. Hmm. All right? What really ends up happening isn't that people get shut out of the, the playlist world, because there's a million playlists. Right. What really ends up happening is that they get stopped from having DJs. Mm -hmm. DJs used to be one of the most important people to break somebody or yeah. a new act. But now there's not really the DJs they had. There's well, now the there's a playlist had. curator. Yeah, now there's a playlist curator. So it's actually better in that world than it is trying to get on the radio. Yeah. I can go get my... Well, it's my disseminated so broad now. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, you, you think of like a smaller market like Kansas City. You have a handful of DJs mm -hmm. who are doing your particular format, right? And that's it. Mm -hmm. Where like there's like hundreds of thousands, if not millions of playlists all around the world in all different markets with your format or a diverse format where people are just hungry for different songs, which and you're not going to, you're rarely going to find that. I'm not going to say you're not, but you will rarely find that on a radio station as well. So yeah, again, I think that points to the opportunities that are there. Now the hustle is way more real because mm -hmm. no one's showing up at a club and being like, I believe in you. I'll open all these doors. Like that's not happening. So now you have to bet on yourself to <laughs> call back from earlier and hustle it and, and get it the out record there. labels are recovering from that. Yeah. Because we have so many independent record labels now. Yeah. Because the record, I think the record labels, they, they figured this out, although they were slow to catch on to streaming. Mm -hmm. Like they screwed up with Napster. And they they kept, dropped the ball. They were that. trying to fight the technology yeah. as opposed to how do we leverage yeah, they, this they technology. They totally screwed yeah. that side of stuff up. But the record labels survived mm -hmm. because they understood how to make, how to make a product. They understood yeah. how to, to provide a service, how to set up a, a, a touring schedule. They understood all the rest of this kind of stuff. Not to mention that you know they had great studios and stuff that are less important than they used to be. When I think it seems like, from what I'm reading and, and understanding, some of the major labels are approaching themselves more as a resource now to indie labels. Well, so they split now, them. what's that? Invested. Almost every major. Well, there's only three major labels now. If you don't count Disney, Disney's their own whole world and yeah. house. But and the other labels, Marvel, like whatever. Yeah, all the. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now it's, it's like a crazy globber. It's <laughs> Fox and Disney. Everything's all together. It's insane. But they realized that what they really needed was diversity. They mm -hmm. needed to. They couldn't have just one record label that did everything. So right. they started going off and investing in all these little indie labels. Mm -hmm. Every artist that they would pick up, they'd say, hey, do you want to have your own record label, basically? Right. Why don't you go find a whole bunch more artists that you like and put it together. And put them together, you know, and we'll, we'll back you And you can it. come to them for cash, you can come to them for the right promoter or the right mm -hmm. agent and those Which kind of things. Which is great. Yeah. And, and that's why I think that they survived because they had to go off and they screwed up on the, the streaming. I totally, <laughs> totally say they screwed up. That was up kind streaming. of a big deal. Yeah. You know? But... <laughs> But they were able to catch up on the business side of stuff. Yeah. And that's why there's been, I, I have lots of friends who started record labels that <laughs> didn't last five years, much yeah. less ever make a profit. But those record labels are turning a profit still. Mm -hmm. you know, Because they went off and they opened up their, their doors to more people by by. Well, and when you're moving themselves. at that volume, you can afford for certain things to fail and some things work. Mm -hmm. you know. But So for you, great life essentially is, is finding happiness, and then helping other people find their own happiness, yeah. in a sense. So. Essentially, it's my job is to, to wake up every day, look for opportunities to, to be helpful to people. Yeah. And, you know, trying to get other people to be more helpful, too, because that it helps me in turn, it helps other people, <laughs> and it just works well. Yeah. And this, so this no doubt ties in, but when you think of creating great things, how would you define that? Well, great things are things that, that stand the test of time. You know, when I said I, I look back at people that, that I admire, Mm. It's because that still, I might have never met the person, you know? I never played with Jimi Hendrix. I, not, I mean, I never played with, with Miles Davis. I might never ever played with Mozart or any of these people. But why do I like what they did? You know, great mm. art has that longevity to it. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's before it's time so it doesn't get recognized like Van Gogh or something like that. Right. You know, I, I have some paint stuff coming in today because I want to do some work on some more painting. You know, but I'm able to connect to those things because they stood the test of time, because they, they touched something that doesn't expire. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go away. It's not just riding away you know? of it. Created Shakespeare's, its not own way. Get, Shakespeare's not going away right. tomorrow. 
All right? It's not going to happen like that because of how profound their art was, because it worked. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's what I want to go off and do. I want stuff that's not going to be okay for 15 minutes, my 15 minutes of fame here. I want to make stuff that's great, that has longevity, that can go the distance. The long-term, the know? legacy. Great stuff lasts. Yeah. You know? And that's what I want to go off and do. And that's what I work with people to do, is to make stuff that's going to last. Hmm. You know? And you've got to have a good team that's going to work with you to, to make things that are going to last. That's awesome. You know, so I invest in those other people. To me, the, the, I want to make sure that this world's going to last well. Yeah. You know, that quote about, you know, the people that are, that are going to change the world, the people that are crazy enough to think that they, that they can. Yeah, I love that one. You know, it's, it's really almost a very selfish thing because I want the world to last. I mm. want things to go well. Whereas most people oftentimes think that you want to make great things because you want to disseminate everything else and make things bad and you're only caring about the short term and you just want to make a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. That's not true. I For some people things. it could be. But, it could be. And I think right. those people are, are lunatics. Those and, are the but I think are, over time you just see it. You know, after a while you find it. I know there's artists. I, I, I got in my brain right now mm -hmm. where it's like over time you just saw they were in it for themselves. And then other people who struggled at first, but they had that right focus. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, yeah, everyone balance, wants man. them to win now because they're like, they're in it for the right thing. So, so that's a good balance in. to have. Yeah. You know, when, when you have good intentions and good, good out point, or outputs that you want to go off and, you know, to reach, mm -hmm. things actually line up a lot better. Yeah. They're, they're stumbling along the way. It's not Absolutely. always perfect. <laughs> but things work out a lot better when you have good intentions and you have yeah. you know, good values that you're trying to push down and you, you can be at least honest with yourself about what you're doing and honest to mm -hmm. other people about it. Like I have no problem talking about what, like if I'm working on a song with somebody, you know, if we're working on a, a song or a video or whatever, I have no problem with us criticizing what's wrong with it. Mm -hmm. you know? I don't care. You want to criticize me and make it bad? Great, great. I'm cool. Right. I'm glad with criticism. I have no problem being offended by something because if something can offend me, it's great. Maybe probably, probably some truth to that. If right. something's offensive on stuff. It's like, ooh, that hurt. That's it's oh, like <laughs> right. You know? Oh, you didn't like that 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 note? Oh, why not? And I want to delve into it and being honest about that. Mm -hmm. You know, and being open to being offended in the first place. Well, it's how you. How get, I think if go, you don't. Go, surround yourself with people who are willing to bring that perspective, you're not going to learn. You're not going to grow. You Which know? I feel is dangerous in the society we live in now where it's, it's about not being offensive. We want to live in a, a type of society where we're not going to offend each other. Yep. I, I forget who was saying it, but he said, I think it was Jordan, Jordan Peterson, he said it. He said, if you're going to think, you're going to have to be offensive. Mm -hmm. Which harks back to that, um, to be or not to be. Yeah. You know, to be or not to be, you know, whether it's, it's nobler to suffer the slings and arrows and stuff. Like, you have to be open to being attacked on stuff mm -hmm. if you want to grow. Right. Be able to defend yourself. you got to learn how to defend yourself because sometimes you're going to be wrong, and it's okay to be wrong. Right. You know, that's... Well, and that's how you eventually can learn that next step or that better way and, and give it the power. I think, I think the, uh, the other crucial step is giving the feedback the power it deserves, where mm -hmm. it's like there's a lot of people with a lot of opinions. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. And I think sometimes people can, like lose their shit over like a comment on Instagram yeah. <laughs> where it's like it, that doesn't have to have a lot of weight no but if you have a musical partner or a producer or someone you're working with they're like that's not working and this is why and this is how you can fix it like that's when you give that but that's when you weight. learn how to see the value of different people mm -hmm. this is why now uh, until like the idea of democracy at one time I was all about democracy because I thought democracy works yeah and I can see it sometimes democracy doesn't work. In what it, way? Pick, okay, imagine like you're in a band, right? Mm -hmm. You're in a band. I see. And you're talking. trying to go I thought you were talking macro. Anyways, go ahead. It can, it can work in a macro uh -huh. sense too. It's, it's almost like um, when I see, can I think of something that everybody really agrees on? And that's mm -hmm. a hard thing to do. Yeah. Because people Because even are if I agree with you, I may not fully, it might or not I be, think this exactly. is the way you solve it. Or I got in a great conversation with someone who is like, like pretty hard right. I'm pretty liberal. Um, we were down in Houston at a showcase, another performer, and we were just talking. And the reality was, is we all want, we wanted the same outcomes, really did. We mm -hmm. just had different opinions on how to get there. Mm -hmm. And so that even that was interesting. Where it's like, no, I agree, and I agree, and I agree. But this is where I don't, and this is how you change it. You know. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know, and I, and I know I, had, I said something earlier. It's like tipping off. Like I used to be a liberal, very liberal mm -hmm. person. It's not that I went far right and went into like. Um, 
into the Republican world on stuff. Because yeah. I kind of skipped past the Republican side of stuff, went past fascism and stuff, and went all the way over to anarchy. Because <laughs> I, I love the idea of, of less laws making things yeah. well work, too. Whereas instead of having a lot of laws to make things work, mm -hmm. I saw the idea of, of, uh, of both of those kind of being kind of rough right. patches and stuff. So I, I do. I, I mix and, and move very, very much so all through these different types of things. I might be very progressive socially on a lot of ideas and mm -hmm. stuff. On, on, I'll give you an example for like gay marriage. Yeah. I was totally cool. I have no problem. Never had a problem with gay people. I wanted. I had no problem with gay. The problem I did have with it is that we had laws that were in place that made gay marriage illegal in the first place and now we're trying to make laws to make it legal in the second place when i'm thinking saying, to myself mm -hmm. why is the government even involved in this i have several friends that's how they feel they're like they just they're like i just think blanket the government shouldn't be involved in marriage at why? all why yeah why are they stuck in all this kind of stuff you know and then and that becomes my kind of problem when i see the the, the way that i see both parties now trying to work mm -hmm. we're trying to make more laws to have more things happen when i realize that Life doesn't follow those laws. Yeah. You know, when I, when I thought of racism and stuff, slavery was made illegal hundreds of years ago here mm. in this country, and yet we have the highest number of slaves in this country that we've ever had. Yeah. We have you know, child slaves. We have uh, labor slavery. We have all this kind of stuff still going on very much so. Hmm. Child trafficking is, is very high yeah, in this huge. country now. I think Organ there is trafficking a, going on. All this things my going. only rebuttal in that regard, because I, I definitely have tendencies towards what you're talking about, like the idea of a lot less uh, laws and those kind of things. I think there is, even when you look at like civil rights era and some of the laws that were put in place during that, it's like there adds a cultural legitimacy. You know, I think that's um, when I talk to my friends about gay marriage, those who are gay and want to get married or have been married, it's like, it's, it's this idea of legitimizing it culturally. Mm -hmm. So where it's like, finally, after however many hundreds of years, we were said that we're bad. Finally, someone at least wrote it down somewhere mm -hmm. that we're not. Like, we know we're not, but at but least someone are. did. Right. And, it's, it's, and it's hard for me critical. to come from that perspective because I'm in a heterosexual marriage that's mm -hmm. always been fine. You know, so like for me, I'm like, yeah, it helps on our taxes, you know? And, yeah, there you go. <laughs> but, you know, for some of my friends, the fact that they can like live together with their girlfriend or a guy can live with his boyfriend and, and then they can eventually get married feels like a sense of legitimacy from a legal standpoint. And so that's where I get that perspective too. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely have, there's, I, I often say I have libertarian tendencies I do all <laughs> in, in, my, uh, in my liberalness. But, but yeah, it's, but that's the thing is I think it's diving into those nuances of conversation and nuances of problem stuff. solving. I look at the drug problems we had to face mm -hmm. as a country. I look at the racism problems that we had to face as a country. Yeah. That we're facing all the things that we're still facing that mm. laws should have taken care of. Right. And yet what I've seen happen more often than not is that the arts have actually moved us further along mm -hmm. much better. I agree in that. You know, like people like Snoop Dogg or Jay-Z have done more in my, in my perspective mm -hmm. as a, somebody who most time when, when a police looks at me, they see a black person. Yeah. All right. And I've had my ass beat plenty of times by the police. I've been, pursued by institutional racism yeah. many times over. Laws didn't fix that for me. Laws were actually still against me in that. Hmm. You know, it didn't help me. What did go off and help me to make it so that people were a lot more uh, understanding of who I was, was music. So to where it brought an awareness brought, of what was actually happening to the mainstream culture? But, I mean, right. that too, but just to, to like somebody, because like, you hmm. go from hating somebody or hating somebody because of the color of their skin mm. to, oh, I can kind of understand what they're talking about to, oh, I kind of like what they're talking about. Oh, hey, we're exactly the same. Or, yeah. oh, I like what you're doing. Oh, I want to do what you're doing. I see. All right. Sorry, I'm about to bring up J. Cole for a third time in one <laughs> podcast. This is ridiculous. But, like, that's, he, he actually talks about that too, where, like, now being black is cool mm -hmm. in a lot of ways in popular culture, where, mm -hmm. like, um, even, even people who would probably still have racial, like racist tendencies are like emulating black culture. That's and it's this really strange point of life and culture here in America where it is. It's, there's this tipping point. Hip hop is taking over. Black culture is taking over. Um, and yeah, I, I can see how that would dismantle hopefully a lot of racism. <laughs> I mean, at one point uh, we, we started talking about how, and this is probably in a handful of decades back, but we started talking about how jazz was an American music. Mm -hmm. 
so much music throughout the world is now very American, whether we talk about punk rock, yeah. whether we talk about blues, whether we talk about jazz like that, we talk about hip hop. These things have been massively influenced from the black community oh, yeah. in America. Right here. I'm loving the idea that people start to identify with, with these different things, because I don't see it as a cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. What I see is as, as a sharing. Yeah, you know, and as well, I, I think that's what art should be as a artists, sharing. Of, artists do this. That's very why I, I get cultural appropriation in some regards, but I I get real nervous when people talk about in the idea of art because I feel like art is the merging of you well, know I don't even know like more. Kuya. It's like there are El Nino. They're like they're like rap rock mixed with like like Hispanic beats underneath it. So it's, they'll have like the Santana vibe and then they're screaming over it and it's like death metal on top. And you're like, what the hell's happening? But it's really cool. And it's all these different cultures merging together because people took a little from here, a little from there and we made it their forward. own. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I'm all about. It's about moving forward. I see hmm. down in the South, there's a, a big movement where it's Southern food mm. being mixed with traditional Chinese food. Oh, really? So you have soul food mixed with Chinese food. Nice. What an amazing I've never tried that. that. Yeah. This is stuff that's like, you would have never thought of that, maybe. It's, you it's know? interesting. There's a... a Eddie Moore is a jazz pianist that's been, he's part of this series as well, um, early, one of the earlier interviews, and he equated appropriation, we got on this conversation, and he equated appropriation to food. He's like, no one gets mad when you're, when it's like a Puerto Rican walks into an Italian food restaurant and wants to eat that. Mm -hmm. He's like, so why? Because he, he's a black pianist uh, from Kansas City, but then he also goes to Costa Rica and plays jazz down there, and he's starting to work on bringing artists from Costa Rica back to perform in the States and like kind mm -hmm. of, again, this merging of different cultures. And it was cool to hear his perspective on that a very similar thing, but he specifically brought up food as well. Cause we don't think that way with food. We're like, yeah, Tex-Mex, throw it I'm together. This kind of stuff to open up, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I enjoy seeing when, see, I feel like that there, cause I, I, I think we're like the human race. Mm -hmm. This is not the races all split up and we're all completely different little people that have never mixed in any way, right. shape or form. That doesn't seem real to me. It's more like we're one big race that we, we're more like cats. Like the cats don't, we don't all just, we're all just different colored little cats and stuff. But at the end of the day, you're just a cat. Right? <laughs> we're all just little cats, you know? So when I, when I think about how we can be better off together, because I feel like we work better together. Yeah. As, as, as human beings, we work better together. Mm. Instead of us trying to be just in our own little box, stuck in our own little room, doing our own little thing. Yeah. It doesn't seem to work out very well. You know, it seems like it's, it's better when we go off and we say, okay, I'm going to take a little of this and I do a little something. Here's, here's what I did with what you guys gave me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like jazz in, in a lot of ways where this is what I took in, this is what I'm putting out. And up. I can't exactly copy it, right. but this is kind of a version of it. And musicians, we play off this stuff all the time mm -hmm. where it's like, okay, well, we took this rhythm and now we played it this way on this instrument. And now, you know, I, I learned it from a piano, but I play it on a horn, you know, and then it's, this is my version of it. Yeah. And then we get something new. You know, to exactly. me, when I listen to, to people like Jimi Hendrix, I think to myself, okay, well, this kind of sounds like some, some jazz on this type of thing, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever. These are, this is how we actually move forward by, by copying and taking things from each other. And, and not and, suing other people. And not sitting here and getting just caught like up. <laughs> Because if we're going to get caught up in that, <laughs> right. you know, things oh, are, yeah. are going to be very rough very quickly. And I, I mean, I see that happening now. Almost every other, Every other month, it seems like somebody's yeah, suing some somebody hit. because something heard sounded kind of like this. And imagine if that happened during the blues era. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's my shuffle beat. <laughs> what? Yeah, because that's the thing is when it comes my down, like there is blatant stealing that happens. Mm -hmm. But I feel like when it is, it's it's pretty clear. But when you got to really like dig, well, I guess that kind of sounds like that yellow card song. You yeah, know, that's, that's uh, one of the, the, the most recent one I'm Lucid up. Dreams uh, from. That's my son texted. He's like, "Do you see the new lawsuit?" <laughs> and I'm what like, uh, "Who's that artist?" Who Juicy does? something. I think something. Juice like World. Juice right? World. Yeah. yeah, Lucid. Did you just say that? Yeah. Sorry. Oh my bad. <laughs> yeah, something. Um, like but yeah, I'm like, man, that's. I didn't even get a chance to listen to the the yellow card song because I can't remember that particular one. But again, even if it is like exactly like it, like he probably just grew up listening to it. And it's just in there, rattling around. And well, I would say I, I would push people to encourage these things. Yeah. Because if we if we do that, and then we're honest about where we took them from, mm -hmm. even better, you know. Then we learn how these things are built up, and I mean that that takes me into science. What if scientists never used what came before right. them? You use that study <laughs> to show you the next thing. Like, whoa, 
That's how that's, that's how we're supposed to go off and that's explore. That's collecting so. knowledge. Yeah. That's why we have the technology. I mean, that's was, a that's a cool thought about. I'd, I like, see it with they essays. have to rely on those. Yeah, you need to. Mm-hmm. Well, my girlfriend's writing her essays right now, and when she submits an essay, mm. all right, it goes through a whole thing that's supposed to scan it and see if it's been plagiarized. Uh, all right, but there are there's only so many ways to say something. All right, yeah. we're talking about pretty. These are pretty standard like cases that they might be talking about. Like this is, mm-hmm. oh, like how do you define schizophrenia? Well, there's only so many ways you're going to be able to say right. what schizophrenia is. There's only so many ways. You have to plagiarize these people. Yeah, you change a little here and there, but... Yeah. But her, her, her essay can kick back because we're... I mean, I'm looking at these are words that are like... It's like, guys, this is a field of study. that has been around for a bit. Yeah, like, and this need, you need to copy stuff. If you, if you play music and you don't copy anybody, yeah. what are you playing? There's only so <laughs> right. many notes and there's only right. so many chord progressions. There. <laughs> you better be copying somebody. What, what I want to see you do is try to make it more complex than something that's just so simple. Right. You know, because now we have a thousand different instruments, mm-hmm. you know? Okay, give me Mozart, but play it on a synthesizer for me. Yeah. You know, with some weird new soft synth that's available. Go exactly. do that to me. It's mixing things, but, but yeah. Because so. otherwise, if, if you're going to give me the same thing, then why would I pay you for it? Right. You know? Which is why I think that music has been devalued in a lot of ways now, because people are okay with paying 99 cents for a song that took a long time to go do. Right. Okay, that makes it reasonable to me. I can understand that. That sounds like the laws of supply and demand. Mm-hmm. That's not following a, a government law. That's following yeah. laws of supply and demand. What There's a whole lot of supply. Because yeah. I can go listen to music for free all day on YouTube. Why would I pay you 99 cent for it? Mm-hmm. You know? So you really have to make it a real reason why. Well, I think that's where brand comes in. Yeah, and um, that's what... Like, the, if your brand I think that is nobody has that thought about believe. brand the way they do now yeah. in the music business. It's everything. Yeah, now people actually think about their brand. Yeah. You know, I think there were some people who were ahead of the time. I think Prince was a good person mm-hmm. to think of somebody ahead of their time oh, yeah. that was thinking, hey, you know what, this is mine, I own this. Or Ray Charles, I think, did that as well. He was right. like, I want to own this or whatever. Good ideas. Some cool, cool people that were frontier people for mm-hmm. the music business now. But now everybody has their label. Yeah, but now, <laughs> and that's the thing, and now I think it's, it's your story, your brand. I, I think of those almost as, as interchangeable now, mm-hmm. um, where brand to me isn't just about how it looks, how it feels. It's like the actual story you're telling from your everyday presence online as an artist, your, each, each song and how it builds to it. You know, I think all those things play a role because that's when people, that's where you find your super fans. That's where you find the people who are like, they're at the, they know they, they, they're at your show and they know that they can just follow you on Spotify, but for some reason they wanted to buy that thing, whether it's just because they believe in your story and they want to support it. So that's a tangible way they can do it. Mm-hmm. Or they're like, no, I'd like to actually own this piece of it, mm-hmm. this actual physical <laughs> yeah. copy of music um, or the t-shirt or those things because they simply connect with what you're doing. And it's not just like, there's a lot of great singers and there's a lot of great songwriters. So mm-hmm. what is it? Again, that's going to get someone to give 99 cents or pay $15, $25 to come see you live. I think it's got to be that story, that brand now. And I think the artists that are getting that, um, those are the ones who are are coming up. to Even to where I think genre doesn't even matter as much as like an artist will kind of do this kind of song. Then they'll come out and do it. But it's at the same level execution. It's the same... Like you can tell, it's like their imprints on it. Yeah. But it's just it's a little different. But then people are like, oh, eating it up. See, I that's, love this. that's the part when I see that mm. everybody's upset about automation. That's not going away. Yeah. People are not. People don't want a computer to tell the computer story. Yeah. People enjoy listening to somebody else tell their story. Right. They they enjoy those little trip ups, the parts that are little uh, mistakes, I guess you want to say. They enjoy that. That's why we love Batman Begins. <laughs> we want to know how it all started now. <laughs> yeah, no, but now man. we can actually watch people's journey start to finish, you know, or hopefully not finish, start to success where it's like you can follow an artist now from their first song and they're taking you, the, the ones who are doing it right, they're taking you behind the scenes and showing you like on their Insta story every day, you literally could just follow it. My my oldest son, he loves uh, Juice World. Like NBA Young Boy has been following since. Uh, like they just put out something that they think he's the next Tupac. You know, yeah, and he's yeah. been following NBA Young Boy before he like like what those like basically his first few songs. They found him like through Snapchat or something, and so he's been following on Snap and following on you know social media. And so for him, it's like he was so excited when they said that, That's and the, the New word, York man. New York Times I think said it. And 
for him, he feels like I was part of that story. Like I got to see, you know, all the five, five, six times he's been in and out of jail and all, mm -hmm. you know, all this stuff. But it's like he feels like he's gone through this journey with him. And it's like you can say what you want about his music or about who he is as a person, whatever. But he's managed to tell this story mm -hmm. and weave it to where now the New York Times is talking about him. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've ever, I don't know if he's ever had a song on the radio. I didn't need it. He doesn't. <laughs> yeah, like it's it's impressive. But that, so. that word "exciting" is is how I wake up. You know, mm. I'm excited to get up. I'm excited to get on. You know, it's like a kid who gets up for for Christmas. Yeah. Excited because they got stuff downstairs to to come and open. <laughs> You're like, what are we gonna do? I yeah. look at that when I open my emails and stuff. That's I'm awesome. excited. I'm like, oh man, I can't. I'm not upset about it at all. Yeah. I'm like, oh man, I I got to see some people today. Like, hey, guess what I get to do today? That's cool. You know. Oh, what do I get? You know, and I'm excited to wake up the next day, mm -hmm. and I got stuff coming up tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day. You know, that's I'm that setting mindset, up more. man. That's that's legit. It, it's I a, dig it. It's a, a. I feel like it's a better way to live my life than afraid of everything or sad about how everything's going or thinking it's the end of the world mm -hmm. or whatever. You know, because if it is the end of the world, I probably can't change it. <laughs> so right. might as well be happy on the way yeah. out. <laughs> so if, it's, if it's gonna be rough, it's gonna be rough here. You know, but. Nothing's killed me yet. Yeah. And as many times as I've gotten down and been really close to having things be really, really bad or you know, to be dead and, and gone out of all of it, it hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. You know, I've lived through many apocalypses. So I'm, I'm ready to go off and face another one. I know? just saw, um, you, you'll probably remember this. So I just saw it was a sticker, an actual Best Buy sticker. And, then, and oh, it said, make sure you turn off your computer on 12... 31.99. I remember when that happened. And that, I just died laughing because I was like, it wasn't just like group hysteria. It was like businesses, everyone was freaking out because Y2K was going to kill the world. Like no one knew it was yeah. going to happen, which is a whole other topic. Like really, no one understood what was going to happen. Or, I didn't anyway. see how it would have been so, such a detrimental thing. But I, I, I look back, it just seems so absurd back then but now it's like people really thought the world was going to end because our computers no electricity were going to work like yeah <laughs> we're going off the grid guys it's going to be nuts like there's people prepping and like had food packed away that was my and, aunt my and aunt the, had that kind of setup yeah it's Talking about big bags of flour and right. like extra water and stuff like that like so, a whole like a, a basement full of stuff for that so we survived that apocalypse and mm -hmm. <laughs> been, it's been, it seems like every other every other year there's another apocalypse that's right. happening you know uh, right now we got the climate change apocalypse. It's going to be the end of the world here. Right. In less than eight years, we've got to go off and make some new changes, <laughs> or it's going to be the end. I love George Carlin. Uh, I, I I can't remember him talking about climate change though. He said, okay, so George Carlin goes off and he says, uh, he's what he basically says in there. He says people because this is back in like the '80s when he was doing it. Cause he's an old guy now. Yeah. You know, he's dead now, but I mean he's he's, he's, super he's old been been, <laughs> been going, you know. Um, but he, what he goes into saying is that. The world's been around for billions of years, mm -hmm. you know, and, what, and you want to get into religion stuff and how many, you know, if it's a short, short term or long, right. whatever, but that's, that's a whole different thing. But it's been around a lot longer probably than we've been here. And the world will probably be fine. We might be screwed over, you know. <laughs> uh, he's like, we're fucked, but the world's going to probably be fine. Yeah. And the world kind of purges itself of all kinds of problems. And, you know, I forget how many species die every Yeah, every we just got to make stuff. sure we're not, it's not trying to purge us because yeah, we're so fucking the planet. <laughs> we, might, we, we might want to be taking care of ourselves, but we've, we've had ice ages, multiple ones of those, mm -hmm. you know, times when it was super hot here when we, basically the planet's damn near on fire. Yeah. And we've had times when we've had, you know, no life supposed to be on the planet because it gets wiped out from, you know, asteroids. You know, so bad stuff has happened here. Many, many times. But I, we want to survive. Yeah, we want to survive. <laughs> so I'm curious to see how we're able to go off and do it. But the thing mm. is, is that I'm not hopeless about it. Right. I know lots of people who are like, this is the end. This, the, the, we are, we are at the end of time. Things are we're gone. It's yeah. basically all done. I don't think so. Are you familiar with Diamandis? He writes, he wrote uh, Singularity, a few others. He, uh, mm. they, he has like a foundation that's donating like a shit ton of money to people who can solve like huge world problems. Like for example, uh, one of the teams that won the money one year is they, they found a way to, to build like a water filtration system that mm -hmm. can work in third world environments. And it's all built off of, like you can repair it with simple bike parts because mm -hmm. they realized one problem was is people were coming in with these like high end water filtration services or you know whatever machine and once it broke, 
it was done because they literally didn't have the parts or the know-how, anything. Mm -hmm. And so what this team discovered as they spent time in some of these third world countries and their villages, they're like, everyone rides bikes. So if we can build a machine, and I guess it's, a, it's like half the size, you know the storage containers, those big storage units? Mm -hmm. It's like half that size and you can repair it with bike parts and it filters water just like all the time. So it like solved this huge problem. And uh, you have to check him out because he's got that, like we have a lot of hard issues to deal with and some real stuff that's on our way, but let's find solutions. We should and be trying to find the solutions. Like they, they, uh, one team uh, created in an urban environment uh, where they took an old abandoned uh, building and they did, uh, I think it's hydro, is it hydroponics where it's basically like they created a vertical farm mm -hmm. and it's all mist. Yeah. Like for the water and for aeroponics. nutrients, aeroponics. Mm -hmm. So it's just fascinating stuff. But the book's called Singularity. And I think you'd dig it because again, it's, it's like, it's, it's pulling on both sides. Like here's this real world conversation of like, the climate may be changing and we can debate, like people are debating, is it us? Is it? I think so. Yeah, it, I'm like, I, think it's, think it is. I think it's partly probably, I mean, in all my knowledge, I think it's mm -hmm. partly us and I think it's partly like we don't know much about planets. So for all we know, they yeah, go think, through cycles too. I think, the, I think the, the pole is also switching down to the other side. So we're having that switch on the magnetic pole. Yeah, it's like, that seems possible. We don't too. know what that is, but either mm -hmm. way, I think what are the solutions? Like how mm -hmm. can we adapt and overcome in this environment? Because sometimes I drive around like imagining was Mars ever like our planet? What mm -hmm. does that mean? You know, like billions of years ago or, yeah. But yeah. that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but it's, it's, I'm all about working with those people that want to believe that there are solutions mm -hmm. that can be had. You know, it's, yeah. it's like, I remember when, when plastic Peter was... Peter Diamandis, sorry. I cut you Peter off. That, that's his name. I think Peter Diamandis. I'll give it to you. Okay, yeah, I get that, yeah. And I'm back not, to what you were saying, my bad. <laughs> so the, the uh, what was I saying on there? Um, oh, sorry, that goodness. popped in my head. And yeah, I, yeah, I no, derailed no, no. it. Oh, man. Oh, okay, the plastics, I think. I remember when plastic was supposed to be the save us thing mm -hmm. because we were cutting down too many trees. Right. So we had paper bags, paper that, and paper this and everything. And we were supposed to start using plastic because plastic was reusable. And we now... Plastic. <laughs> now plastic's the enemy again. Right. But there was a, uh, a team out of Mexico, mm -hmm. a little private team that had come out there, no, a woman, actually, who had come up along with this, but she was having a, a biodegradable plastic. Nice. Not too many years before this, we had had somebody who found a bacteria that was able to thrive off eating plastic. So it was like you put, the, awesome. you put the plastic in there, it eats it up and stuff, and it mm -hmm. decomposes it. You know, something that we thought would take forever to decompose, it's able right. to do, you know, to live. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. So when I, when I see these things, I'm, I'm like, well, if these people thought it was just the end of the world, and instead they just went to go protest and make it so that, like, plastic got banned. Right. They might not have ever been able to figure out the solution for the alternative. Because I'm all about the alternative. I'm like, yeah, okay, we want to make things better and cleaner mm -hmm. and work out better. If we notice most countries that have, um, you know, no big change on the, the middle or the, the lack of the middle class and everybody's poor, essentially everybody's equally poor, there's no super rich companies. Right. It do, they're not blaming the rich companies for being the ones that have those countries being in really dire environmental poverty type issues. Mm -hmm. Places like India or all over Africa and stuff like that or Southeast Asia. Those places don't have... There's like what, no middle class. Yeah, there isn't yeah. anything this. But they're, they're hella dirty. Mm -hmm. They're rough. Whereas I see some places here in America where we have some of these big companies that are offering some of the alternatives to actually make it so things can be cleaner. Right. You know? Well, I, that's why I respect Tesla a ton, uh, Elon Musk, that's a, and, that's a, and that's what a they're doing. That's a great example of it. Where yeah. like as a company... There, it's always that question, will they long-term survive? Who knows? But let's say they don't. Mm -hmm. I still think what they've done as a company, if they've pushed an entire industry where now even government regulations that are coming down the pipe, the, there's car companies going, no, nah, that's not good enough for us. We're going to do better and like on their own. But businesses <laughs> do that. for. I think yeah. about it for, for the food industry. In fact, I think it's a, a very good... Um, dissertation to look at with what happened with organic food. Mm. All right, over in Europe, GMOs got basically banned. Yeah. In a lot of countries, actually, the, the GMOs have been banned. All right. We here in America did not ban GMOs. We allowed organic to go off and to just do its own thing. Right. But people have been asking for it. Mm -hmm. And now we have whole grocery stores that will sell only organic stuff. Exactly. It's Aldi's, uh, Whole Foods does that almost exclusively. That's right, they did stuff. switch to doing you know, that. These things have 
there's not a law that made that happen. It's co- consumer demand. Consumer demand changed that. Well, and I think it's culture, too, is I think people <laughs> bringing a lot of awareness to it. I think culture plays, even when it comes to guns, when it comes to food, mm-hmm. when it comes to taxes, all these things, it's our cultural perspective that has to change. I, I, I personally think sometimes laws play a role in that, but I think ultimately it's culture that's going to, even down to like gay marriage, like you talked about music, where it's like mm-hmm. when you have rappers actually coming out and supporting gay marriage, where it's like, you have these people who are starting to like, who are uncomfortable with it, because even hip hop culture and homosexuality is like a tough conversation. You have, uh, who was it, Little Yachty, uh, put a gay couple on his album and mm. pissed a lot of people off in the hip hop culture, but he's like, you know, this is what I'm putting out there. But that's and what it's supposed it, to be. And it's like it's culture, it, yeah, it starts to envelope. dismantle <laughs> people's perspectives and open up to where finally, like, I, I think there's people still fighting against gay marriage, but on a whole, the cultural attitude towards it is like, why would you stop that? You know, like Mm -hmm. whether they think you shouldn't, like you're talking about, I know a lot of people are like, we shouldn't be involved in marriage at all, so make it all fine, Mm -hmm. or they should legislate it either way. It's like those things dismantled prejudices that ultimately have changed us, and it's been a cultural push, so Mm -hmm. I think it's huge. Um, Just to wrap up, though, so with you doing the coaching, um, I got a lot of followers who are also like musicians and all that. So if, if you could maybe like give like your one takeaway, maybe it's like the first thing you really try to, to bring to a new artist that you meet. Someone where you're like, he's got potential, she's got potential, but hey, let me come alongside you. I want you to think about this. What would you say to them? I would say that value is something that you need to understand. The value of yourself, the value of your time, the value of other people, and that it's not something that's just static and it's not defined by your, the minimum wage law. It's defined by what you believe it is and what somebody else is gonna believe it is. And that that value is dynamic. It can change all the time. You have the ability to change your value. Change your values themselves. That value is, is, a, is the word that you really gotta understand, the value whatever it is you're doing you know i dig it man that's awesome thanks for making the time this has been Appreciate awesome it, that makes me want to talk for like another two hours just on value <laughs> um but i'll have to come back around and do that again so thanks Glad a lot have me. i appreciate it i appreciate it a lot man thanks that's cool man Thank you for listening to the Live and Create podcast. If you like what you heard, make sure you subscribe and leave a comment or a review. The Live and Create podcast.